Well, it's lovely to see everyone. Some of you for the very first time, actually. Yeah, lots of you we've met on email and haven't met before in person, so that's really nice. Yeah? Yeah. Now, um, we have to have a few little... Um, I was just say housekeeping, housekeeping, yeah. housekeeping things before we begin, and then we'll give you a bit of a summary of what we're going to do over the coming week, and uh, and then we'll get stuck into talking about spiritual things with you. How's that sound? Um, okay, it's really really good to meet those of you we've never met before, and uh, we'd like to welcome you along. These are very informal discussions generally. And even when they're quite large, so we've had some in, in Australia that have been up to two or 300 people, but even so, they're still quite informal, generally. So we don't have any song and dance routine that we do. <laughs> Mary used to be a dancer, but <laughs> she's dropped that song and dance routine. <laughs> I'm, feeling, I'm feeling a bit unworthy to be up here today. I'm having a bit of a rough day, so... Yeah. Um, but I, I'm, I'm excited to meet all of you and share with you, so... Yeah. yeah. Now, um, can we just have an idea of where everyone, where everyone is from? So, so who's from England? Those from England? So you have a look around <laughs> at all of you from England. So, <laughs> ah. <laughs> so how many of you is there? There's two, four, six, eight. There's about ten or twelve from England. Yeah. Okay. Let's have a look around. You might want to connect with each other uh, if you haven't met each other prior. Okay. Um, now let's come into Europe. Who's from France? You're alone. Nina. Nina. <laughs> Germany. Germany. So three. three. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who's from Sweden? Uh, Lovely. I almost want to break out into an ABBA song when I see <laughs> you guys. But anyway, I won't do that. But there's, there's also someone from Norway, isn't there? Yeah. There's yeah. Norway. Yeah. Okay. Lona. Um, any other Scandinavian countries represented? No. no? Latvia. 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 Yeah. Cyprus. Cyprus, welcome. Okay. Nice to meet you. Latvia, Cyprus. And we've got some from Turkey, don't we? We have some yeah. Tur Karen from Turkey. Yeah. Um, and Gabriella, where are you from? US, Italia. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, who's from the USA? Hello. Michael. Oh, yeah. Karen here. Yeah. Hello, guys. Two, one, two, three. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're from Mexico as well, Mexico. so there's, um, wow. who's from who's from Russia? <laughs> You're from Australia now, you rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> from both. From both, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, no worries. And who's from Australia? Who's from Australia? Yeah. Okay. So a few visitors from Australia. Cool. No yeah. worries. And lots of the Aussies have. Now, um, have we not covered him, yeah. anyone? Is there anyone missed out? <laughs> of course. <laughs> We're in Greece. <laughs> Who's, Who's from, from Greece? Greece? <laughs> Who's from Greece? You get to put up your hand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. And, and, and Albania. Albania. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, cool. Yeah. Thank yeah. you to everyone in Greece for having us. It's really a beautiful yeah. gift. Yeah. yeah. And we've already uh, had a few discussions with people in Greece and some of the people in Greece are now quite frightened of me and so they haven't come today. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way it goes. Mm. So... Um, yeah, so there's quite a lot of a wide a variety of people here today from different places, hey? Um, obviously, probably us guys from Australia have travelled the furthest, I, I think, perhaps. Or from the States, you're probably a similar, similar distance. Yeah. 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 All right. It's really uh, good to meet all of you who we haven't met before, as I said. And uh, what we normally do at these venues is we usually just have a break about halfway through, about uh, two hours in or one and a half hours in, and there's, there's munchies up the back, uh, you'll notice. So when I say munchies, I'm using the Australian slang. <laughs> That's food, for those of you who don't know what that is. And uh, we normally have a break, have some food, a bit of a break you know, for a half an hour, three quarters of an hour, and then we continue with the subject, basically. Also, um, if you, because we're going to do question and answers uh, today, so if you just raise your hand when you want to ask a question, and just wait, f we'll indicate you, but wait till the microphone reaches you before you start your question. That just means that everyone, that that means it will be recorded, <laughs> but that helps a lot of other people who then go and watch a DVD or a YouTube clip. Yeah. So. so every session is recorded. So we'd just like to point that out to you. 
And, and we find that that's really, really good for most people because it means that if you have a question, and, and as you know, many of you who have watched DVDs, if you've had a question that often has been answered through watching the DVDs. Through someone else through asking your else questions. Asking the same so, question. Yeah. Now, up the back, now where was it, Joy? Um, where were the DVDs? Oh, you haven't oh, put yeah. them out yet. Yeah, we're, right. We're the so on that project. table over there, yeah, I'll just put my thongs on. Okay. Um, for for now, what's happened is we've sent two, we've sent eighty uh, sets of DVDs to Greece, and only forty of them have arrived. So we don't know so where far. the where the other forty are at this point. But um, the forty that have arrived, what we would like to do is those of you who are not in Greece. If you would if you feel happy, feel free to take the, a set of DVDs. There's so this, a, you just it's a complete what that set is, yeah. of the secrets of the universe. They've been remastered, so the sound quality is a lot better, and you can copy them at any time as well to give to friends or whatever. The, the secrets of the universe, longing for divine love, longing for divine truth, an introduction to prayer, and humility, humility and faith. Are the subjects of the on the DVDs? Um, there's 14 DVDs in total. Take the entire pack. So they're they're just a gift from us. They're a gift from yep. us. Right. And a uh, lot of Eagles' work in remastering has has gone into that. And some people in Australia have done the artwork. And yeah, yeah they, they, they look, look quite pretty, eh? Hey? Look good. Yeah. Um, so obviously, if you're from Australia. Don't take one. Because it's better <laughs> you for You can a, get one at yeah. home. Um, if you're from another country other than Greece, if you can take them, because when this other box comes, all the people in Greece will be able to get uh, boxes from, from those if you haven't already got some. But uh, feel free to take them today when you, uh, before you leave. We, we don't want to take them back to Australia if we can get away <laughs> with it. So that's the, that's the set of DVDs. Many of you probably would not have seen the one on faith yet. Um, because that hasn't, I think it's only just recently been put on YouTube and uh, it hasn't been mastered before, so that's a part of that pack. All right, I think that's pretty much everything. Yep. Yeah. Should we start? <laughs> um, now, who's got the microphones? Okay, Katerina Anna and, and Katerina. Anna. Awesome. Uh, with the microphones, all you need to do is hold them up fairly close so that you can hear yourself in the sound. And then if you can hear yourself, we can hear you. So if you could just bear that in mind. If you, could sp if, you could, if you do have mobile phones or anything, it would be great if you could turn those off or put them on silent for us. That would be great. Is there anyone here who's never seen a DVD or never seen, a, seen anything about us before? Yep. Yeah. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Hopefully it's easy to pick up what we're talking about. We try and explain everything as we go. So. Yeah. yeah. And because a lot of the people may have asked questions that they have heard, heard some s about certain subjects before, um, we will try to point out what DVD that particular subject might cover or what uh, YouTube video that might cover so that if you want to watch it yourself, you can get more of a detail on the background of that. Does that make sense? Yep. No worries. Okay. We're, half, we're at your disposal. <laughs> This is a time when everybody goes silent. And goes, <laughs> who, who goes first? <laughs> Just behind you, Anna. Thank you. Okay. I'm a little nervous about talking into a microphone. No worries. Uh, I don't know if this goes into housekeeping. It came up with Nina the other day. Yep. But uh, my soul kind of flipped when she talked about discussing the potential learning center in Europe. Yes. So this is my question. It's not a question. It's yep. just a subject that... I feel attracted to. Right. Who, yeah. who else would like to talk about a potential learning centre in Europe? Okay. Fair awesome. Enough. Um, so. We were thinking of actually having that discussion uh, next, next weekend on the Sunday, but who would miss out on that discussion if we did it then? <laughs> okay. Okay. So, no worries. Well, that's no good. So we might... Uh, Maybe tomorrow... Uh, do you want to talk about it now? Um, we can talk about it now, but, uh, but the, I suppose the subject matter is also, uh, it involves earth changes as well to a degree. Because you, you don't want to set up a learning centre that, that in six months' time or nine months' time or you know, a year's time, due to different changes that are happening around the world, um, that 
you know, you no longer can survive in that location. So what we want to do is to validate some locations of where a potential learning centre would be best to set up. And I have my own ideas about that that I'm happy to discuss with you, but the problem with discussing ideas that are not yet fully formulated is that people then have a habit of taking that and running with it uh, without uh, further confirmation. Now, what myself and Mary are doing, and we've explained this to a number of groups already, is that we are investigating the process of earth changes through discussion with quite a number of different spirits at the moment. And we, to, to have some firm, to give you some firm idea as to what, what locations on the earth are going to be relatively safe locations and what locations on the earth are actually going to be quite difficult locations to live in. And uh, we haven't finished that investigation yet. And we don't envisage finishing that investigation for another few months yet, probably. Um, that being said, there are certain locations that we feel quite certain of that are, that are going to be quite safe. Um, but, it, that being, but to discuss them prior to being sure and having some surety, um, sometimes people feel is a bit um, unresponsible of us. It really depends on whether you feel that or not. Um, how, how do you feel about it? Have you got the mic with you still? Yeah. Well, it raises another question and something I've been struggling with. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this uncertainty is creating my own uncertainty about following desires right now. Yes. I have like these desires, but then I feel totally braked to start acting on them. Yes. Which is obviously my own injuries as well. But yeah. I also feel like this message, like wait, 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 just wait for more information. Yeah. In terms of setting something up. Yeah. And so when Nina mentioned this learning center, you it just and you mentioned it as well in a talk about the learning center in Australia. I heard yes. about going around the world, <coughs> and something just lit up. Yeah. In yeah. me, so uh, I feel this. We feel quite strongly that uh, there will be learning centers. We feel there will be five major continents that will be relatively safe in terms of earth changes, and there will be large numbers of people surviving in those locations. And we feel that there will be learning centres eventually in all of those locations. Um, but that will depend very much upon the desire and passion of the individuals who are associated to those particular locations. In Europe, um, Europe itself, we feel at this point, and this is where... I, I, can I put a... Again, say in front of this discussion that I'm not 100% certain about what I'm going to discuss with you now. And since, since that is the case, you need to take everything I say now with, with a degree of uh, you know, analysis for yourself. But my current feelings, uh, which I'm happy to discuss openly with you about Europe, are that uh, most of Europe as you know it in the Western European areas will, will be very difficult uh, to, to be... Uh, in during the process of changes. Um, we feel at this point that uh, Italy um, is going to be one of the first places on the planet that has a supervolcano erupt. Um, now, uh, we haven't investigated that further, but there's a supervolcano in Italy called Camp F uh, F Flagari or something like that. I can't remember his exact name. It's uh, near the city of Naples. In fact, Naples is in its caldera. Yeah. Uh, no, Vesuvius is a tiny volcano in comparison to this. This is a supervolcano. A supervolcano, um, if I can describe, is... Uh, you know the standard volcanoes, which you see generally a mountain with uh, a, a small um, caldera, usually it's only a few kilometres across, where um, usually... Uh, quite a lot of material comes out of, but in terms of a supervolcano, it's one one thousandth of the material of a supervolcano that w w is usually put out in a normal volcano. So a supervolcano has the ability to actually uh, erupt and spew out 3,000 to 5,000 cubic kilometres of, of ash and dirt and dust. So, so, and lava, of course. So... If you can imagine that, that's a lot of material. Now, if a supervolcano goes off in Italy, most of Europe will be affected by that volcano. Um, 
if you're within a thousand kilometres of a supervolcano, generally you'll have some kind of um, pyroclastic cloud uh, issue. Which uh, do you know what a pyroclastic cloud is? It's a it's a superheated uh, air and ash travelling at up to 600 kilometres an hour. Um, and when I say superheated, it can be heated up to 1,000 degrees centigrade. So it, it instantly basically fries everything in its path. Um, so a supervolcano spews out. Uh, in fact, the problem with the supervolcano is that in, the, in recorded history, we have had none go off. And so we don't, scientists still don't really know what uh, a supervolcano would do if it goes off. But there is one, uh, Italy is sort of like a, Italy is pushing up towards the Alps um, and there, are, uh, there is a lot of pressure on it at the moment. In fact, uh, some of the volcanoes around here are going off, but you also have quite a lot of seismic activity, earthquake activity and so forth. And there is a constant, uh, the scientists at the moment are quite worried about Italy uh, and, and the supervolcano in Italy because of the fact that it's not being measured very well and it also is showing signs of activity, which it has been doing for some time. Uh, it has raised the level of the ground by, I think, close to, um, I think it's close to six metres over a period of ten years. So it's actually put something underneath, is pushing the ground up. Now, uh, the discussions we've held already with the spirits that, that are involved is that that supervolcano will, will have, you'll have a few days' notice at the most of that going off. And uh, the, the main notice will be birds falling out of the air due to carbon monoxide poisoning. And, uh, and then there'll be some seismic activity in, in Italy, uh, three, three, earth, three earthquakes in three specific areas which form a triangle. And once those three specific areas uh, are destabilised, then there is a high likelihood of this, this supervolcano erupting. In terms of time frame, that, uh, we, we have yet to confirm the time frame, but, but at this stage, and it's very hard to predict it, but at this stage, they're feeling sometime February, March next year for that particular event. Does that make sense? Um, now, if that does happen, then... Um, the entire of Europe would be, from that point on, wherever you are in Europe is where you're going to stay, basically. There will be very little chance of you flying to another location after that point because of the amount of ash and dust in the air. Um, it would be totally impossible to fly. There are other forms of transport, of course, but, but there was a, there's going to be a lot of... When you talk about 3,000 cubic kilometres of, of lava fly, going into the air and ash, uh, there's a lot of ash deposit that will then interrupt life quite strongly in the European area. And, um, and you know, initially up to 1,000 kilometres from that, from that eruption would be very, very hard to survive um, in terms of food and water and just basic human necessities. For that reason, um, there are some quite safe areas in Europe but most of them are more towards the east in Russia and uh, more towards the north, like in Scandinavia, um, that are more safer areas than the rest of Euro Europe. And uh, this part where we are now is highly likely to not, not be around uh, after that point. Now, so that means that basically um, you have quite a fair bit of time to determine what you want to do with your desires and then work out where you want to go and where you want to live and what you would like to do. But like I said, rather than basing your decisions upon what I've just said to you, it would be better that we can confirm the information before, um, you, know, before you change your life. Unless, of course, you already have a desire to change your life in some direction along those lines. Um, there are quite a few people who have felt strongly for some time that that places in Russia would be really lovely places to develop a learning centre. There's many people in Russia, we feel, who are spiritually open 
And it's going to be very, very interesting in Russia after Earth changes, we believe. And in fact, we feel quite strongly that we'll be visiting Russia after Earth changes quite frequently, um, once we have the means to do so. The, the other areas of Europe um, are going to take some time before they stabilise. And there will be pockets of people surviving in all different areas. Um, but the difficulties of survival are the issue that you face. You know, how are you going to provide food for yourself? How do you provide clean water for yourself and those kind of basic necessities? Um, have you still got the microphone with you? Mm -mm. Do you have any questions that you want to ask about? Well, that? now it's getting too personal, but, yeah. and so we can, you're totally free to say we could talk about it or not talk about it at all. <laughs> My alternative, I can go back home to another super volcano. Where's home? <laughs> US. Well, in US. California. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Which is highly likely. And I left California because I had a feeling that that's just going to go. So I went to Italy where I have uh, a home base as well. Yep. But I have felt extremely uneasy in Italy. Like I do not want to be there at all. Yeah. And I've been in crisis about this because oh, if I go home, that's yeah, not a safe place. Can you see how... Um, Already there's not trusting yourself. Mm -hmm. Like You see, the beauty, mm -hmm. the beauty of trusting your feelings is that you can then be inspired, generally from spirits and so forth, you can get inspiration of what to do. Yes. When you don't trust your feelings, um, that's when everything starts to enter into confusion. Mm -hmm. So yeah. my suggestion yes. is, is to have a look at the feelings involved. Now, you were right. The, the, the spirits that we've spoken to at this point suggest to us that there will be three primary eruptions on the planet. The Italy eruption will be first, the Yellowstone eruption will be next, yes. and then the last eruption will be in Indonesia, in, yes. in, Suma in Sumatra. And they are all super volcanoes. Um, and in, in the case of Yellowstone, there's three of them all going probably at once. And in the case of uh, Sumatra, a very, very large one. Uh, there that has a caldera over 100 kilometres wide um, that uh, will probably erupt. Now, those eruptions will proceed uh, and will happen very rapidly, according to the spirits we've, we've talked to already, um, and will probably happen over a period of three weeks at the most or maybe a month or, or, or around about that period, they feel. And... After, those, after the third eruption, there will be a destabilisation of the plates, the tectonic plates of the planet. And as a result of the destabilisation, the Earth will actually tilt. Um, they feel it'll tilt up to 15 degrees. Um, and that being the case, there'll be huge amounts of water travelling at high speed, yes. which will then inundate uh, large areas and large portions of land around the Earth coming from the south towards the north on one side of the globe and coming from the north towards the south on the other side of the globe. Okay. Yep. Now, um, that all being said, um, what mechanism can we use to actually determine where we wish to live? Well, the mechanism is trusting your feelings about where you want to be, firstly. Mm -hmm and trusting your feelings about what desires and passions you have in terms of what you want to do with the rest of your life. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, now, a uh, we feel that people who follow their life with a passion will always finish up being, if they, if they are following their life not based on injuries or addictions, but rather based on passionate desire to live in love and truth, and they also have a passionate desire to live after earth changes occur. And by the way, some of you don't have a passionate desire to do that. Some of you feel you'd probably rather pass than live in a world that's very different from the world that we're living in, right? And that's okay too. You know, at the end of the day, passing is just a transition and you're still going to be alive and everything's going to be fine. So from our perspective, there's no need to be afraid of anything that may occur, even if you pass. There's no need to be afraid because you've got a life in the spirit world you can enjoy. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, so, and the life is one seamless life. You don't have to worry that something, you know, that something terrible is going to happen. It's just one seamless life. So the key is just do you want to live here after Earth changes or don't you is really the, the key choice or decision. And if you do want to live after Earth changes, what, 
do you want your life to be? What kind of things would you like to do with your life? Because the world that you know it currently is going to change very, you know, into a very different place. And all of the things that we're often passionate about here on Earth at the moment all involve usually economy, politic, you know, and a lot of other things regarding the world. And the reality is many of those things won't even be available for us uh, to involve ourselves in. So, so this is where we need to really feel about what do we wish to do with our own life in the long term? Feel about the desires and passions you have in the long term. So what are your desires and passions? You're asking me now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But this is one reason I came this week, because there's so much confusion. Yeah. There's so much pressure on me about it, because I feel, you know, my life depends on it. And so when you're in a state yes. of fear, you, yeah. you can't, you this can't is now feel the your fear desire. Can, yeah. And then the spirits are really playing on this. Yeah. And I'm torn in a million directions. So, and, and this is... Um, so this is the fear kicking in. Yeah. And, and this fear detunes desire. Yeah. Yeah. This is why I often feel very reticent to speak with people about earth changes because everyone is already in a heightened state of fear and instead of processing that fear yeah. and really finding their own yeah. pure desire within, they seek someone else to tell me what is the safe thing, yes. to help me take away the fear. And, and in the end, it, there's no guarantee anyway. If you're living in fear, your law of attraction dictates you will attract things that trigger your fear. Absolutely. And but you're so triggering me to connect to my fear now, which is good. Yeah. It is good. <laughs> <laughs> which and is what I've been avoiding. Exactly. I haven't been able to connect. And yep. I feel like I'm in limbo. And I, so I said, I, you know, you've got to get the courage, yep. you know, to go to Greece and hear all these things you don't want to hear. Because that's the only way you're going to get out of it to feel what you want. Exactly. So this is... One so perhaps the, b the best thing to do then is to discuss fear in a lot more detail. Okay. Um, because it's the fear that is going to dictate what happens in your life in the it long is. run. Yeah. And uh, what we'd like to do perhaps in part of this discussion is discuss more about fear and, and uh, how fear changes and how to actually feel fear and release it rather than holding on to and living in it. Mm. Yeah. Can we have a mic over there? Is it on the same subject? Uh, yeah. 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 But it's on why the earth changes are happening, not just what. <laughs> no worries, that's, that's fine. That's what I feel I'd like to know more about, although, you know, the fear's there. Sure, and well. um, we're perfectly happy to discuss why. Um, there's, a, there's a combination of reasons why earth changes are occurring. Firstly, there is a cycle that happens here on earth around every 12 and a half to 13,000 years where the earth gets bombarded with... Uh, with, with a certain type of matter that's in, that passes through us, actually, and, uh, and we are not harmed by it, and the Earth itself is not harmed by it, but it co does cause structural changes to the Earth itself. And this cycle occurs because of the different waves of energy that are coming from the universe. And so we, on, in, in this universe, in, in the Milky Way galaxy that we live in, at the centre of the galaxy, there is a huge black hole. And this black hole determines what happens with every solar system that surrounds the black hole itself. And then, and then we have smaller black holes within the Milky Way galaxy as well that whole solar systems rotate around. And so you could say we're all rotating around this great, great galaxy, slowly getting sucked into its vortex, actually. But it's a very slow period in the, in the sense that um, one rotation of the galaxy occurs every 450 million years, right? Just one rotation. And so um, one rotation of this galaxy, and we've only historically had, I think it's about uh, 13 of those rotations in this galaxy, historically, happen every 450 million years or so. So we've got this one rotation of the galaxy occurring and then we've got a rotation occurring around our own, uh, a closer black hole that our whole solar system is, is rotating around. So you've got this rotation going around like that, going around a galaxy, like so. And every 13 and a half thousand years, this rotation passes an emission of energy coming from its own black hole, which, which destabilises much of the matter in its vicinity. And then every 450 million years or so, um, we, 
we, we're passing around and getting closer to these. But we're, so we're rotating around 450 million years around the galaxy. But we're also now, every 13 and a half thousand years, passing twice, 26,000 year rotation it is. So every 13,000 years, we pass the centre of the line coming out of the galaxy. Babe, now, do you want to use the whiteboard? Um, it's I'm a bit hard to draw because it's, it's called a double tyroid uh, in the way mm -hmm. that it looks energetically. There's all this energy coming out in a toy, toroidal system. And uh, I'm just wondering if do there's a picture on the net that we can refer to that describes it. Um, I can't remember where. There's some pictures on the net that can describe how it looks physically. <laughs> But it, but it is a physical, there's a physical basis. It's a material there's rather than a spiritual event. No, no, no. It's, or it's both. So it's and both. we'll talk about both. Okay. What happens is every, also, uh, God has a series of, um, God increases the potential of um, the human race and also creation. all creation, in fact, through a series of um, ever closer gaps of pushing out more love into the universe. And the Mayans realised this with what was called the Mayan, you know, the, what's referred to as the Mayan calendar. They realised that there's periods of time, cycles or periods of time, which are ever decreasing up until the point of 2012. And these cycles are emissions of love that they realised, they started calculating that every emission of love that's put out the universe. They didn't call it that, of course. But every emission of love that's put out to the universe causes an increase in the potential of what all matter is capable of producing and life is capable of producing. So, for example, the first emission was the actual spontaneous creation of the universe itself, the matter in the universe. The second dimension, emission was the creation of the for or the formulation of planet planetary systems and so forth. The third emission uh, it was the formulation of the potential for life on each planet. And the fourth emission, you know, begun by, by the vegetation and insects on the planet and so forth. And, and you get this creative cycle that's occurring. And every time God emits more love into the universe through these black hole systems actually, is how this love actually comes out as a substance. Um, that it actually affects every single thing, it, it, all, all matter in, the uni in that universe, including our own souls, including our own life. It, it also affects everyone in the spirit world as well, not just people on earth in the physical uh, or in another location in the universe in the physical, but rather it affects everyone. It affects every single person in the spirit world and also on Earth, because they're all part of this same system. So most matter in the universe is actually not physical in nature. Most matter is spiritual in nature. And all of this, all of this matter is affected by these emissions of love that are coming out in ever-decreasing uh, periods of time. And in higher intensity. So in the first period of time was 13 or so billion years. And then the second period of time, I think it was in the millions of years. Some, I forget the exact number. I think it was 600 million years or something like that. And then the third period of time is much less and so forth. The onset of man occurred in the fifth or the sixth area of time. And that was a couple of hundred thousand years ago and, and so forth. But every time, every time there's a new potential, what happens is every part of creation is able to do more than it could do before. And all of a sudden, new forms of creation spontaneously come into existence because of the potential. And God is continuing to rise these potentials as well. So, so you've got these general galactic cycles occurring, and then at the same time, you've got these specific periods of time that God is increasing the potential for everything spiritually and physically that exists. And that potential, which is, which is raised, then allows new forms of creation to come into existence. And it also changes us, believe it or not. It changes our own, uh, our own cellular structure even can be changed as a result of these new forms of potential. Now, scientists have only, only just really starting to discover this process. Uh, there are some scientists who, who are not religious at all. They don't have any belief in spirituality at all but they're now discovering that there are these series of times. And, um, and in fact, 
some of those scientists uh, are basing their work on a man called Terence McKenna, who has passed, he's dead now, but he discovered these linkages between what the Mayans had spiritually discovered and what science is yet to really fully discover about these cycles of time that are ever increasing, they're compressing. And we're living in the time of the greatest compression of these cycles, right up to the period of 2012, to the end of 2012, is the greatest compression of that cycle. So beyond 2012, we, ha we, we expect, and most of the spirits in the universe expect, the potentials to change quite amazingly because of these waves or cycles increasing, increasing in their intensity and decreasing in the time between them. And as a result of that, eventually what will happen is new potential will occur on the earth and also in the spirit world regarding life itself. And that's how God creates. Um, God creates through this slowly raising the potential <laughs> through the general, general feeling of love that comes from her. This is not the divine love that we're talking about, but rather another part of God's love, which, is a, which you would call agape love, um, love that is general for all of her creations. And she constantly pumps out this love in ever-increasing amplitudes and decreasing periods and yeah. to, to improve and grow the potential of life in the universe. Does that make sense? And they are all coinciding in the time in which we're living now. So a physical process that occurs regularly, cyclically, in, term, in the form of earth changes, is coinciding with a time of great potential for ourselves as part of God's creation to extend our potentiality, to extend our so really our soul, our soul's development. Yep. Yeah. Does that make sense? Thanks, yeah, that's very helpful. I mean, there's a lot, I'm not sure I've understood everything, but it's given me something to think about. Yeah, um, there's a lot you can do to investigate this on the internet, yeah. actually. There is a lot of information available on both the spiritual side of this, but also on the physical, the scientific side of this. And it's really fascinating when you investigate both sides of it, um, and you'll be able to see the correlation. But the interesting part is that, that the time we're living in is the time of correlation between these two thing is occurring and that is why we are all having our relationships challenged at the moment most of us by now many of us now are not in relationship in fact they've found that uh, in different studies that actually this is the generation that has the least number of relationships um, in comparison when I say le relationships I don't mean temporary ones I mean permanent ones uh, you know, we have plenty of temporary ones, but they don't seem to last very long for many of us, right? But uh, permanent relationships are, are very hard to maintain at the moment because of the changes that are being drawn or almost forced upon us in a way through these different potentials, if you like. Yep. And the way Thank God you. creates is by raising these potentials. And so what's happening, the earth changes are co-relating with these, with these potentials but the earth changes also correlate with these galactic cycles that are occurring as well. Now, in the end, um, if you look at the fossil and historical record, you will see that there are these series of changes if you go back through history, particularly if you look at the ice core records, but also the records with regard to fossilisation. You will see that there's periods in time, uh, of time that are of cataclysmic change that have occurred very regularly on the Earth. And uh, these periods of time are not due to global warming or any other <laughs> Earth, you know, human effect, but rather they are totally due to these cycles that, are, that appear uh, constantly that are affecting us here on the Earth and, in fact, in every other, for every other part of the galaxy and, and also all other galaxies as well. So all these changes are all happening as a result of God increasing the potential mm. of the human race. Yeah. And, and what you were relating about relationships is this, as these waves of love, if you like, hit into us, they, they hit up against anything that's in error within us. And that's why life feels quite tumultuous in recent times because it's hitting into us and we have this opportunity to utilise a lot of what we're teaching and to um, release what's in injury 
within us and then we harness even more of this potential that God is, is providing to us an opportunity to harness. Yeah. And the more we hold on to our fear, the more we are going to be confronted. So, so for many of us, what we're doing is we're holding on to our fear and living in it. And if we do that, then we're going to be confronted more and more by these increasing changes. What we need to learn to do is stop living in our fear and start just feeling our fears instead, which is a very different process than living in, an, living in fear and acting upon your fear. So our suggestion to people is to stop uh, living in this fear and living their life by their fear, but rather feel the fear and then live their life by their desires. Now, if you do embrace the process of living your life by your desires, even though everyone around you is living their life in fear, you will generally find that you'll be at the right place at the right time when, the right, when different events occur. That's gener generally going to be the case. Because in the place of desire and no fear, you are now quite inspired as well. In other words, spirits can now speak and give you inclinations of go here, go there, and you follow your passions and desires now. You're not trying to you know, get away from your passions and desires. Now, when I say follow your passions and desires, to be frank, there are not many passions and desires that are technical in nature, um, you know, in terms of how we see technology today, that are going to really survive the coming events. So a lot of our passions and desires actually are far more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're not external to ourselves. You, m many of us are still living our life very much passionately connected to external things and we don't want to connect to ourselves inside of ourselves. And, and it's only by connecting inside of yourself that you'll actually learn what your real passions and desires are. Right? And so many of us are still seeking outside of ourselves to have our passions and desires fulfilled when the reality is if you actually start feeling what you desire inside of yourself, you'll find that a lot of your jobs that you currently have and a lot of your ways of life that you're currently involved in, you don't really want to do. You know, you feel bored with or you feel annoyed or you're only doing it because that it's a way to get money or as a way to live in today's life, you know, to, in today's world. Bear in mind that this new world, if we can call it that, which is really the same earth, but just with uh, a lot of the current things, the current systems, out of place, you know, no longer there, this new world, if we could call the, the changes that are happening that, then this, this world will be a world that is very different to what we're currently used to seeing. Now, many of us feel pretty happy about that, right? But we're yet to really embrace it as well. We're, we're, we're sort of, in a lot of ways, we're trying to live in today's world and then think about what we're going to do in this new type of world, but then we don't want to let go of all of the things we like in today's world, right? So, there's, for example, most of us like comfort, do we not? Yeah, most of us like to be comfortable, yeah. So, so any time my comfort is triggered, I, I, I don't, don't I, I don't want to give that particular thing up. But do you think if there's no electricity, there's no running water, there's no food that you can go down to one of the supermarkets and get? Do you think you're going to be very comfortable then? So, isn't it better to deal with the fear of discomfort now, while you have the opportunity and while it can be to a degree, dealt with without there being much pressure, then deal with it when you've got huge pressure to deal with it. Can you see? So there's a lot of emotions that we have that we could start dealing with now if we desire to, um, that would actually put us in, good, in a good space for when earth changes do occur or when world changes do occur. Because there, there'll not only be earth changes, there'll be political changes, eco economic changes and so forth as a result of all of these things. Now, can you see at the moment, many of you can also already see, particularly here in Europe, you've already got countries that are under so much financial pressure they're already starting to go bankrupt. Like Greece is one of them, isn't it, like, that is starting to, to go into that place. And, and, of course, the pressure on the world's economy is so great at the moment 
that it's highly likely that only a small event can cause a cataclysmic collapse of, a, of the economy. So even if no earth changes occur, there's still the high likelihood of economic changes occurring. Do you see? How many of us would be afraid of that? Uh, we, we say no, but, you know, a lot of times we think, you know, imagine we're so used to going, and where would you get your food from if you can't grow your own food after that? Can you see? Like, how would you get food? You'd have to be reliant on somebody giving you food who they, and they've grown it, wouldn't you? And what about the first three months of that time? You know, you can grow something in three months, usually, with food. Sprouts, of course, are a bit different, but general food you can grow usually in two or three months. But what happens in two or three months before you've grown it? Right, what do you do then? And these are all questions that we can begin to resolve inside of ourselves if we wish to, but many of us don't want to. Many of us still want to live in the life we're living and we don't want to resolve the questions, uh, these kind of questions about what we want to do. And we, many of us are not self-reliant at all, are we? We're, we're totally reliant on the system we're living in. We're not self-reliant. We're so used to relying on other people to do it for us. You know? Do you want to keep doing that even? These are all questions that you need to ask yourself. See, if you're living in harmony with love and you're living in harmony with truth and you're living in harmony with desire, well, love would dictate, firstly, that I don't make you responsible for my life, wouldn't it? So that means that I don't make you responsible for cooking for me. I don't make you responsible for cleaning for me. I don't make you responsible for getting food for me. I want to do a lot of that for myself. Does that make sense? Love would dictate that I want to do that. If I, live in my li if I live my life in harmony with love, I would be desiring those kind of things already in my life. Can you see the relationship between those things? You see, many of us are so used to this economy, ec economic system that we're in that we don't even see the economic system itself is not harmonious with love. Right? Is it? Because it, 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 what, what it does is the people who earn the most money can buy the most things, but very few times the people who are earning the most money are actually doing anything to really look after themselves physically. They're reliant on all the other people to look after them physically. That's how it becomes. And, and that's not harmonious with love. It's not harmonious with love for me to expect you to clean my toilet for me when I'm the person who used my toilet. Does that make sense? I should want to clean my own toilet if that's... That, that would be the most harmonious with love thing to do, wouldn't it? The most self-responsible. The same goes with my food, the same goes with my shelter, the same goes with my water and everything else. I have the ability to, to do all of these things, but often we don't uh, because we want to rely on the externals. And can you see also that the governments themselves now are trying to take away the ability to do many of these basic things for yourself? Like, they're actually... They're genetically modifying seed so that, so that when you grow a plant and it seeds, the seeds are useless. You can't even plant those seeds and have another thing grow anymore because they've all been genetically modified. And, and so already there's all sorts of things happening on this planet to take away self-responsibility, give it away, give your responsibility up to somebody else. Now, my suggestion to you is the more you can take responsibility to, for your life now, from the over the next 12 months in particular, the better off you're going to be in the long run. If you desire to live on earth still. Yeah. Can we come... Uh, Fee, you had a question up the back, did you? And then if we can come across... That anymore? No worries? Come down then. Yeah, I just got this uh, feeling that... Uh, I don't, I don't know why you choose to come this time, exactly in this Earth Changes time. Why you, why, why, why you come here to, to tell us this? <laughs> um, I mean, why you choose to come back just in this time in the Earth, in the galaxy? Because this is the time when there's the highest potential of mankind actually embracing divine love in their lives. You think about it, if, if everyone's very stuck in the mud... You know, they're stuck in their way of life, stuck in what they do day to day, 
uh, not wanting to look at anything much externally, not wanting to investigate, being quite closed-minded, quite closed-hearted as well, um, then it's very, very difficult to motivate a person in that space to investigate anything other than what they've already known. But if you have a whole series of events occurring on the earth and also in, 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 in countries and so forth that cause upheaval and turmoil, that is the time when people reappraise things. That's the time when they start going, eh, is our way of life that we have it now really how it should be? And they start questioning a lot and they start becoming a lot more open-minded and open-hearted to new truth. And, and we, feel, we felt before we came in the spirit world that this was the, going to be the best time. And obviously we were quite connected with God about feeling from God that this would be the best time for divine love to be presented at the, on the earth again and, uh, and where most people would start to you know, embrace it eventually because of the time of upheaval and the time of change. And that doesn't matter if this new world that you can call it afterwards, how it could be, it does, does it make a difference or you mean... It's, it's well, it makes a difference in that everyone has to now conceive of a different world than they've used to for the last hundred years or so. So... So in that regard, people are a bit more open to, to, to things. Also, they are going to go through many emotions in this process of change. You know, whenever you're confronted with change, do you find it quite emotional? You know, isn't that the time when you find yourself crying because you've got this change and crying because you've got that change and crying because you have to put up with this new thing and that new thing and that you didn't have to do before? And, you know, just that process of change causes us to be more connected emotionally and therefore by nature we're going to be more connected to God and more connected to our desires and passions and so forth. Does that make sense? And so it's a perfect time for us to be on the planet. That's what we feel. Yeah. Mary doesn't always feel that way, I suppose, do you, darling, now? Or are you starting to? I feel it's the most loving provision that God can make is to provide the the key to the growth of your soul at a time when you were faced with a lot of change and, and the error within is being confronted by this, this love. Um, yeah, I think it's a loving, a loving provision. Yeah. I don't feel very worthy to be the messenger of that. <laughs> um, and so that's possibly what you're referring to. Mm. Yeah, mm. but I feel it's, it's a loving thing if I can embrace that potential within myself. But I, I guess all the 14... Of you, yep. was the same, same, have the same meaning, the same, yes. the same desire. Yeah. Can I have a, a question beside that? Is that all of these uh, fourteen are are younger than you, or no, no? There's no. only at the moment four of them. No, who, younger than you. Oh, sorry, they're all younger than me. Yes. Yes. But there's only four of them that are really starting to embrace who they are. The rest of them are in different places of fear. Really, they they have. They've imbibed, if you like, they've, they've had the same kind of fear background as many of you have had, but on top of that they have the fear of having to find out who they are and all of those kind of things too, which is, which is a pretty intense fear as well. And so many of them are in a state of total denial of who they are. Um, but there's four of them who, who basically have a strong desire to start embracing themselves and start embracing why they came. Why they came to Earth? Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, yeah. You've gone off for some reason. So, getting back to the discussion about the Earth changes themselves, um, can you see that our worry about it is not really? We need to feel our fears and our worries about it and deal with that, but we also need to act in a manner. It's just about taking off, actually. Is that just because I'm turned right up or we're close together? I don't know. Um, so uh, when we worry about it, what we're doing is we're, um, we're not allowing any inspiration to come to us. We're not allowing our passions and desires to lead us to the appropriate location and so forth. Does that make sense? That's what's happening when we're worried. So we're far better off, rather than worrying so much about it, we want to feel our fears and deal with our fears, but we also want to make, want to make f decisions based upon our desires, passions and, and logic as well. 
we want to make decisions that will lead us to the right location. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Nico? Uh, is, it <coughs> is it possible to explain us the fear of comfort? Because it's, it's the first time I really grasp that aspect of uh, fear, you know? Yeah. Because in the past, uh, I used to live a lot in the nature and stuff, and I've, I know how to survive. Yeah. I know survival, yeah. and I know what to do let's say, for the fir th first three months. Yep. Can I say that it's really hard to do so? <laughs> and it's really... In comparison to, freeze, to our life, yeah. You know, during the winter, in order to have a bath, to be honest, and I know even means to warm the water, but it's too much effort. But this is, this is the thing, you see, after Earth changes, there won't be the power, there won't be mm -hmm. all these other things that we are so used to having on a day-to-day -day basis, you know. Many of us are used to turning on the light as soon as it's dark, yes? No. And what do you do at night? You might, what, sit down and read, watch something, watch a movie. You might go out at night, you know, go to a place, party a bit, right? You, what else do we do at night generally? It's like, and many of us, I don't know when you normally go to bed here in Greece, like, but what time of the night is it? in Greece generally that most nine, people... Uh, during the winter or during the summer? During the summer. During the summer is about 9 o'clock, 9.30. That's when it gets dark. Yeah. But most Greeks don't go to bed when it oh, gets dark. About 1 o'clock. Exactly. <laughs> most of them go to bed at midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, whatever. Now, in between that time, we're so used to having power at our disposal. Can you see that? Mm. Now, imagine for a moment there was no power. That would basically mean that when it goes dark, what would you do? Well, you'd go to bed, probably, wouldn't you? You'd go to sleep. And then when it got light at 4.30 in the morning, what would you do? You'd get up, right? Now, most of us are so detuned from nature that we finish up going to bed at 11, midnight, and we wake up at, you know, 8, 7, 8, 9, sometimes in the morning or whatever, but, but there's, the reality is, if we were in tune with nature, what we would do? We'd be getting up when nature gets up, going to bed when nature goes to bed. That's what we'd be doing. And we'd be doing everything in between that. It's in, if you think about your day-to-day -day life, when it goes dark, many of us then prepare our meal. Now, that's not going to be possible if there's no power. Can you see? Like, if there's no power, you're not even going to be able to see to prepare your meal. At, when it's dark. So what you could do, you'd have to have meal earlier, wouldn't you? Then might be a meal as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, might not be a meal as well. <laughs> but, but the reality is we can still grow things, so we can still make a meal. But, uh, but the timing that we do it. What, what I'm illustrating is we have become so detuned from the natural way of doing things because we have power and other things at, and gasoline and other things at our disposal. Yes? You take away those things. Take them away. Just try it for, for a week. Take away those things, those two things. Power, electricity, and gasoline. Take those two things away from your life and experiment with that. How, how does that feel? Let yourself feel the emotions that come up as a result. Does that make sense? If you do that, you'll be far more prepared for what will be happening on the earth after, after these, with these changes than you will be if you stay reliant just because you have them available to you. And, and I guess the point we're making, it's not to decry having comfort in your life. No. That's a lovely thing. We're not built to be cavemen. And, you know, obviously we've reached this point through a process of desire that we can use our energy for, our, actually for our passions and desires. That's how, you know, we're not making the fire every day and, and doing all of those things. But there is an emotional investment in now. In, there's an injury now in many of us around comfort. So what we're suggesting is that you deal with the emotional attachment to the to comfort. comfort. And for myself, it's surprising the different emotions that I've worked through around comfort. Um, they, they actually relate to a feeling of being unloved. 
inside. If I, if I have no comfort, the feelings that come up inside of me are relating to I'm not being loved, I don't want to care for myself, I want someone else to care for me. Like a lot, it's so it's surprising where our emotional attachment to comfort has hit us as an injury. As an injury. Mm. Sometimes it's an unexpected emotion that you find when you do without the comfort. So if you think about wintertime when you're cold, what's the first thing you go for when you're cold? Well, <laughs> most of us don't go for a jacket, actually, if you think about it. You think about your life. What's the first thing you go for when you're cold? Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> Many people go for a hot drink, do they not? Right? <laughs> or hot food? Or... You, we, we often... We're cold, we're dressed in shorts and a t-shirt like I am now, we're cold. We walk inside, turn on a heater, rather than putting on clothes even sometimes, don't we? Because we like the freedom of not having the clothes on, as much clothes on, so we go and turn on the heater instead. You, can you see how we're so focused even on our day-to-day -day life that w whenever we ever any comfort issue is triggered, whenever we feel cold, we automatically seek hot, hot things... But what if those hot things weren't available to you? What would you do then? Freak out. <laughs> Freak out, yeah. Like, most of us would probably go into some kind of level of fear and distress or some level of anger and annoyance, actually, that's, that's not available. How do you feel when you go home and you switch on the light and nothing happens? For many, it's angry. That's the first feeling. I pay for my power and it's not going on and off we go. Imagine that every day. You go home, there's no power <laughs> at all. Because you don't get internet connection. Yeah, yeah now yeah. when people don't no have internet, internet yeah. connection. <sighs> yeah, I haven't got a fast internet connection. In it, you know, <laughs> like, I want a fast run as well. And, and we get so upset about those things. You see, what we need to do is start embracing a life where we know we can live without all of these things that we know we can still embrace our life and still embrace our desires and passions. Now, our feeling is there's still going to be energy available after changes, but it will be new forms of energy that the people who are alive at the time create. Right? But it won't be the forms of energy that we're now using. Right? So mo most of us at the moment are using either coal-based energy or nuclear-powered-based energy. Right? Is that not the case? How many of how what what's going on in Europe mostly? What's most of your power generators? So coal based. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically coal, which has to be mined with large amounts of machinery, doesn't it? Like right? all of which you know you got to dig deep into the earth generally and get. For many of us, that means that for for Europe in particular, that means getting it from other countries. Like so, often it's shipped from other countries to these power stations. Now, in some places of the world, there's also nuclear react reactors, of course, but the same, the fuel for that is usually coming from other countries, usually from, say, Australia or, or, or South Africa or places that have high degrees of those kind of fuels. And imagine all of a sudden the world doesn't have the fuel for that and that doesn't have the mean to, means to transport that fuel. That means that all of these ways that we're used to generating power are all going to be useless to us. We're going to have to come up with new ways of generating power that each person can somehow apply. Can you see that? Where we as individuals can make it and produce it. Right? We're going to have to do that, otherwise we'll have no power. Simple as that. Now, myself and Mary feel that we will have power, but it'll be more along those lines. It'll be along the lines of being able to produce it for yourselves somehow. And we've got lots of ideas about that, but that's uh, less in terms of our... We're not as passionate about talking about those issues as we are about talking about love and other things like that. And we feel that the soul changes that we make on the planet will actually enable us to be inspired with these other forms of power, just well, like as they will enable us to be inspired about all forms of life. But can you see how just changing the issue of power and gasoline, just those two things, mm -hmm. how much your life would change? It would change hugely, wouldn't it? The whole life. And 
many of us who are living in cold climates would really struggle to live in cold climates under those, without those two things, wouldn't we? Can we see that we, we want to have some other way of looking after cold climates even, other than being reliant externally? And so, and so one of the things we need to deal with is the fears that we have surrounding being dependent on everything around us. That's one of the fears that we do need to address. I think it's not only fear. There's a feeling of entitlement in many people now. I'm entitled to have things. And there's a feeling of a, la a loss of the sense of things being a gift. Um, that, no, I should have the fast internet connection and the power and this and that. And, and um, so for many people, especially... Um, in generations younger than myself, I see a huge sense of entitlement that, that we should be able to get what we want when we want it. And if we don't, then we're angry. And um, so that's not even a fear. There's now an injury that's been placed inside many young people where they feel that they should have something. And that's a huge addiction that needs to be grieved, that that's not a, and that's not a principle in harmony with love. Mm. Yeah. So, so our suggestion with regard to earth changes is basically this. No matter what they are, there's a number of different basic things to consider. Number one is where are you? Where are you going to live? Number two is how are you going to live? And number three is what do you want to do passionately in your life while you're living in that way? Did you, did you understand that? So let's look at number one, where are you going to live? Well, obviously, if you want to live somewhere that you are currently living and there, are going to be huge, there is going to be huge damage to that location, then you're not going to be able to live there very well. So there is going to need to be some kind of decision-making taking place about where you're going to live. How are you going to live? Well, obviously, that's going to be very severely affected by the different changes that occur. And therefore, we need to consider seriously how we're going to live, like in terms of what food is available, what, what you know, clothing is available, shelters available, and in particular, water is available. And then what your passions and desires are also need to be considered. It's no good going to a location that you don't like and living there only because it's survival. You know, that, that's pointless, isn't it? Don't, don't you want to go to a place that you're going to enjoy feel good about, have some fun developing different things and uh, enjoy the life that's present there. When people talk about earth changes, I feel they get hung up on the first two questions. Where's safe and how am I going to live? And they forget what I think is the most crucial aspect. What am I passionate about? And what are, what are my passions in harmony with love leading me to do? Mm. Because I have a huge faith that God and your spirit guides will help to ensure your safety as long as you are developing in love and following your passions. So the, the first two questions are loving to consider, but if you neglect the third one... You're not really loving yourself if you neglect the third one. Yeah. You're and really if, operating in fear. And if you focus on the third one, I feel you'll be led to the answers in the first and second one. Yeah. So it's not to forget about the first two questions, but to keep yourself open to the answers to the first two questions while you focus on the third. Yeah. yeah. And interestingly enough, uh, what many people are finding is when they follow passionately the third question, which is, what do I really want to do with the rest of my life? What, what desires and passions do I have? What do I want to develop in myself? What do I want to give to others? Those kind of questions. When they focus on that question, it's interesting that they're led through those desires and passions to a location or to a, a group of people who have similar passions and desires automatically. And they won't all be people who are on the divine love path, as we call it, right? They'll be people from all walks of life who will all have very similar passions and desires that you can meet up with and, ex and actually grow these passions and desires. And the irony is... They will also be attracted to locations where those passions and desires can grow and survive even when earth changes occur. That's what will happen. Yeah. And I guess, you know, we're teaching God reliance, how you can rely on God. And many people view God reliance as, well, God's going to look after me and I don't have to do anything. 
And God is not, uh, God doesn't encourage us to be passive beings. God knows we're most in connection with ourselves when we're in passion and desire. That's how he created us to be passionate, desirous beings. And so when we step into that place of passion and desire, that's when God can support us more. That's when God can like let out the provisions of, of support and your spirit guide and, and guiding you to a place where you can be safe and follow those passions and desires. God is always going to bring you what you need to develop in love and if you're a very passive person and you're sitting here and waiting for God to like save me God's going to bring you the provision to challenge to challenge that error within you once you step into desire then God brings you the provisions to grow in love and as you do he also supports you to follow those passions and desires but I'm feeling a real uh, deflation in the audience yeah, about this subject. <laughs> Can you feel why that is? Fee, do you want to say something? Yeah, Mike. Uh, um, I felt that this year when I tried to step into my passion, um, I really tried to open to it and to like have some balls by actually just dropping what I was doing and starting doing what I loved. <laughs> And I just felt like when I started doing it, it was okay to start with. And then it just stopped. And I just felt like there's an emotion within me of not finishing things. Because I don't feel that if, if I do it, it won't be any good, I guess. And I guess maybe that is the main emotion. But I love writing. And I feel very expressive when I write. And painting and drawing. And, and also working with children, I feel really passionately about. But, and I've done all three of those things this year. Yep. I feel like they haven't taken me anywhere. Well, the thing to remember about your desires, the beauty of following them is you'll follow them and you'll get to a point of stagnation when you're following them every single time. So what will happen is you'll, you'll recognise what, uh, what passion you have and you'll recognise a desire and then you'll embrace it and you'll embrace it and it will go all right for a certain period of time and then it will just like stop, stagnate. Whenever anything stagnates in your life, it's always because of fear. It's always because of an unresolved emotion that's not getting resolved now. Does that make sense? So whenever we find any of our passions and desires no longer growing, no longer changing automatically, no longer growing, it's because we are now not embracing the other emotions that our desire is triggering. So that's so God's loving provision, the law of attraction, to bring us... Okay, I've hit a wall. There must be an emotion blocking me, something out of harmony with love. So if you for a moment just feel about, all right, what were the emotions? So for instance, let's say the desire to teach children that you have. What were the emotions you felt initially when you felt that desire? Can um, you remember? That, it, that it's so important for children to know the truth and yes. to be given the opportunity. Yeah. But I guess I feel like... Um, Anything else, though? That you, you, these are things you felt. That's more about what the children should be given. I mean, what did you feel when you were teaching children? What was the feelings you had inside of you? I wanted them to have what I didn't have. Like, I wanted to give them an opportunity. Right. Can you see that that is a imposition upon them? So, therefore, the desire is not now... So, you've, you engage the desire... But, but part of engaging desire is now an emotional error has been exposed. Now, what, what I would do with that error is I'd go, I'd go and grieve the fact that I didn't get this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And when you fully grieve that, now the desire will be present again, but it will be without that emotion uh, being pushed upon the children. Do you follow me? Now, when we're not willing to deal with that emotion, we'll go into stagnation. In other words, the children around us will feel, oh, she, she's trying to force me to learn something. I don't want to learn. You know, the, child, the child will feel things from you and, and then resist the process of learning as a result. And then we feel like, oh, things are not going as good as what I expected and not realising that it's because we have, not, have refused to deal with that particular emotion that was exposed. Do you follow me, Fee? Like, so the, the key with following your desires is to follow your desire and when you follow your desire, you will definitely find that a particular emotion will be exposed. 
an impure emotion, if you like, an unloving emotion, will be exposed. And as to what happens with our desire after that point is going to be very dependent upon us dealing with that particular emotion right now. If we refuse to deal with the emotion right now and we close it down, we will find the desire will go down because now we're in a state where we're afraid of the emotion, right? So our desire will go down and nothing around us will work. Automatically nothing around us will work. So whenever anything in my life stagnates now, the first thing I question is, all right, right at this point I must have an impure desire of some kind because otherwise my life will never stagnate. It will always continue to grow. So if you can trust that and then go, okay, well, what is the feeling inside of me that caused me to stop this process of embracing my desires, you will always identify a feeling. When you identify the feeling, it's your willingness to feel that feeling that is going to de depend upon the future of that desire now. If you're unwilling to feel the feeling, the desire now will be suppressed. If you're willing to feel the feeling and embrace it, the desire will grow automatically f further. And it might change in the sense that it will, change in, it will definitely change into a more loving desire every single time. That's the beauty of following your desires. So what we're finding happening a lot is that, and Mary's found this a lot when we, she was talking with the Opening to God workshops um, with people, they'd follow desire to a certain point, then an emotion gets triggered on that desire, an emotion that's where the desire is out of harmony with love, and the person is unwilling to feel that emotion. And because of their unwillingness to feel the emotion, the desire now cannot grow further. It, it is going to stagnate or it's going to go down again. Does that make sense? And that's what's happening for yourself a lot. Where you, you follow a desire and then an emotion gets triggered. You don't want to feel that emotion. So now what's going to happen with the desire? You're not going to feel the desire very strongly either. That's the, that's the subsequent result of suppressing ourselves emotionally. So it's your fear of feeling your emotions that causes your desire then to be suppressed. Yeah? And if you can allow yourself rather than to live in that fear, to, to feel the fear through rather than living in it, and then, and, and then let yourself feel the unloving emotion or unloving, unloving feeling underneath that, because there's always one that's going to be unloving underneath that, then what will happen is your desire will grow rather than stagnate or die. Yeah. It's not just your desire that grows. It's actually, your, it's as you know, your connection with God, your, yeah. your personal <coughs> development in love all grows as, as long as you stay. And this is the, the definition that we developed for the Opening to God workshop of God Reliance. It was um, following your passions and desires as long as you believe them to be in harmony with love. Obviously, if you have a desire that you go, yeah, okay, that's not loving. So if you have a desire to go out and murder somebody, that's not very harmonious with love, so don't follow that desire, right? So the first aspect was following your passions and desires. In order to become reliant on God, we must do this. So if we can clarify, the passions and desires should be harmonious with love if we're going to grow. We must believe they are. Through this process... You don't have to know for certain. Obviously, we're not perfected in love. There's going to be some injury within us. But we ha so we have to at least reflect. Is, does this feel loving to me in my state right now? Yep, okay, it does. I'm going to step into it. But I'm going to um, be humble to the fact that... I must be humble in this process, so... And be humble to the fact that God's law of attraction will bring me the things that will highlight the error within my desire. Highlight what's not loving within my desire. And will so if I can give you an example with regard to teaching children. So teaching children, you have a passion and desire to teach the child. So you're following your passion and desire. And initially you think that this desire is harmonious with love. That's the feeling you have, so you go for it. When you go for it, you sit sitting down with the child and the child starts yelling at you. Now, there's a law of attraction event now. Does that make sense? A child is generally always reflecting the, a, a, an adult's unhealed emotion. So I've got this child yelling at me. What's going on here? 
doesn't feel very good anymore, my desire, right? Having child after child after child get upset with me because I'm trying to teach it something. I would then have to be humble and go, there's something wrong with what I'm doing with my teaching. Because, because if, I, if I was teaching with an open heart and with love, I wouldn't have these children yelling at me all the time. Right? Or it could be that the children were getting spirit overcloaked and you, know, you see their eyes change and, you see, you know, and they start sort of attacking you through that space and, you, and you're a bit afraid of them, you're, like, you're a bit freaked out. And you go, whoa, this child's a bit like out there. Well, there's another thing, my law of attraction is showing me, ah, I'm afraid of spirits and overcloaking and can you see? Like, so the law of attraction is showing me something that's going to interfere with this desire that I have. So I need to be humble to it, to the feeling. There, there was a situation, I mean, just to throw this in, um, I was reading with a child and like, so I have difficulty learning how to read and, um, and it was beautiful and he was doing really well and then I suddenly heard his mother talking to me who died a couple of years ago yeah. and she was really um, upset and crying and I could feel this sadness from her yeah. and it freaked me out because I, I don't normally hear it that clearly yeah. and she was saying oh it's so wonderful that you're reading with my son I wish I could be doing it and thank you so much and but she felt kind of like she was projecting so much sadness yeah. that I, I, could, I was drenched in it and obviously Miles was picking it up and he's very mediumistic yeah. and I just thought wow this is, and I got so sad about it and I got home and I tried talking to her when I got home and talked to her for her quite a long time but then that really kicked off all these things about my son so mediumistic and so many children are naturally yeah. To, to make children aware of what's going on, but then that just seems like such a huge subject. It is. And is that too much to put on a child to let them know? No, most children already know without you telling them anyway. Yeah, true. Um, so usually it's a confirmation of what they already know anyway. Yeah. Um, my, but my suggestion is, again, go... So look at, if you look at the series of events here, what was happening is you had some spirit interaction and you've become confused about what to do with that interaction. So that's an emotion, isn't it? Like an emotion of confusion is an emotion of what, what, what are you confused about? You, can you see that if you embrace telling children about spirits, what's going to happen with the school that you're visiting or whatever? What are they going to do? Yeah, yeah they'll just think I'm mad. Exactly. So, yeah. so they'll be quite upset perhaps, but you think you're mad and so forth. So can you see it's fear of authority and what they will think of you embracing their passion along that direction mm. is automatically now infecting the desire. Do you follow me? Mm. Now, now, how do you deal with that fear? You have to actually feel it and embrace it. What you're doing, though, with it is going, oh, no school's going to let me talk to about spirits or anything to, a, to little children in particular, and I'll have parents at my throat and I'll have you know, all of these different things going. So it's best for me to forget about it, mm. suppress the desire, Forget about it. Does that make sense? Mm. And so, so if we're humble here, you'd feel, you would have processed some more emotion about those things. Even if for you, this is a sense for of yourself. desperation. I can't teach the truth. I, kids can never know the truth. I never knew the truth. Immediately you're back in your causal emotion again. Does that make sense? Yeah. The key is to feel that and then proceed along your desire again. Again, yeah. Right? With embracing that emotion. What we often do, though, is we feel that, we get afraid, we shut that all down, and so now we're not God-reliant anymore, and we're also not following our passions and desires, so we're not enjoying anything anymore either. Right? Then there's the third, there's some more things Mary wants to mention, of course. This is very important, because, and this is something, I think, for anyone who chooses to follow this path, you know, we talk a lot about being humble and feeling one's emotions, but we must have this crucial other element, which is a desire, sorry for my handwriting, to know God's truth in every circumstance. So I'm following my desires and passions, Oh, I get a law of attraction event that brings up something within me that feels yucky. Some emotion I have to feel. So I need to be humble to that experience, to experience the grief or the anger or the fear or whatever is being triggered. But it, simultaneously, I must hold in my heart this desire to know what is God's truth of this situation. Is, am I in error? Is this situation in error? What, what is, what's actually truly happening here? Because that's the only thing that's going to expose the error to in, within myself. 
Because my truth, remember, is very, because of my injured state, it's very different from God's truth yeah. of the situation. So maybe we can give an example again of that. So, so when we hit this part here, we might find we have some fear come up. So for example, you're, you're speaking with the child, you have a spirit speaking to you now, and now what do you do with this? Like you go home to try to talk to that spirit, but you can feel all of her grief about why she's so invested in the child and she's not letting go of the child. And, or, and can you feel there's a lot of your own grief about children and letting go of, you know, trusting that God loves them rather than you having to do all of that. So there's a lot about letting go of children in there, or losing, losing a child in there for you. So in that moment... Fear comes up and then under that fear is that grief that you're just starting to connect to a bit there, Fee. So that grief is present and then there's, there's fear on top of it, right? Now, when I'm in that space, I might choose to hold on to my fear. So in other words, I don't want to know God's truth and that is there's nothing to fear here. God's truth is there's nothing to fear here. I want to justify my fear to myself. I should be far afraid of losing my child. These things could happen with my child that would cause me to lose my child. I have to be afraid of losing my child. So now what I'm doing is I'm justifying myself holding on to the error rather than having a desire to know God's truth about the matter. Does that make sense? God's truth is we have nothing to fear for our children. Nothing to fear. Even if our children die, they are going to be perfectly looked after. Perfectly looked after. Right? By God's the whole system perfectly looked after those child. But if you're choosing, like, say, we have a desire to leave, to leave where we are. Yeah. Um, we have children in England yep. and with parents there. And so by asking the child, you know, you can choose to go or stay, this, this huge grief of losing a child comes up because if they... I also feel like it's not... It feels unfair to ask a child to choose between their parents because that's an injury that I have from my childhood of yes. okay so if I'm going to move quite far away can I, can I just stop you for a moment because it's an injury from your own childhood until you release that injury your children are going to feel upset about the same thing does that make sense so, so you are dead right they are going to be upset because you have that feeling inside of you that you have yet to release now if you released the feeling then you said to the kids, look, these are the, these are the options. We want to go and live in France. You know, we live in England now, we want to go and live in France, let's say. Um, you know, I don't know whether that's what you want to do. But, but, but let's say that was the case, right? Um, we, we'd present that to the children. And because we don't have the fear of losing them in our, in our heart anymore, they no longer feel our fear of losing them. You follow me? So they are totally confident then. All they've got to do is take a choice about what they want. They don't have to worry about mummy. They don't have to worry about daddy. They don't have to worry about mummy's feelings. They don't have to worry about daddy's feelings. They can just choose what they want in that moment. Does that make sense? But when my fear is imposed upon them and my feelings of grief, if they don't choose right, are imposed upon them, now they've got a lot more difficult a problem. Now they have to choose between my feelings of grief and fear and daddy's feelings of grief and fear and mummy's feelings of grief and fear. And now it gets very, very confusing and it's very difficult for them to make a choice. Can you see the difference? But, it's, but if, I've, if, 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 I've, if I'm daddy and I've released that fear and grief of losing them potentially and mummy's let go of the fear and grief of losing them potentially by not living in the same place as them, then the child will go... Yeah, you still love me. I know that. I just want to live in England for a while longer, you know. Or, or yeah, well, what if I come and visit you this time or whatever I go? And, you know, a, the child would look upon the whole thing as an adventure rather than a problem. Can yeah. you see? And can you see how in this process we can, we can say, okay, I don't want to live in England. Oh, now I've got an emotion come up that it's not fair on my kids. Now, if we don't desire God's truth... In that situation, we can even cry about this is not fair to my kids, but we're not opening ourselves to go, okay, if I'm in pain, there must be an error in me. Maybe God's truth is something different to this. And even though that hurts really badly because I feel like I'm doing the wrong thing, if I feel about that, 
then I'll reach this state that AJ's referring to where I feel like relaxed about this decision because God feels relaxed about it. God knows that if I love my child, no matter where I am, my child can feel that. Yeah. Yeah. And that child will feel that. And the the child in feeling that will then feel free to make up its own mind about where it wants to be without having the pressure of its mum and dad's emotions imposed upon it. And this is where what we do as parents mostly is we're imposing emotions upon our children so much that our children are not able to make choices and decisions very easily anymore and uh, and that's a major cause of their distress because they're just feeling the terrible oppression that's coming from both parents so so it's very important that when you follow so if you think for you about every one of your passions and desires you can you see that every one of them or has also had a law of attraction event triggering an emotion in you that causes you to tune from the passion and desire. And that's what happens. When you start following your passions and desires, your law of attraction ramps up because God goes, this is great. We can get, we can work with this. Uh, But then what you do with that is you shut down the desire, hoping the fear will go away. And God goes, okay. It's not going to go away that way. It can only go away by you confronting the fear and working your way through the fear and getting into the underlying grief. That's the only way it will go away. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and the problem for many of us with this process is that, is that we follow our passions and desires, then we expect everything to go perfectly, don't we? And when it doesn't go perfectly, we go, mm, maybe it's not the right thing for me to do. No, it's your passion and desire. Of course it's the right thing for you to do. It's just that an emotion is getting triggered that's out of harmony with love that you need to deal with and then you'll find the passion and desire will just continue to flow if, it, if it's in harmony with love. It will always flow. And this is what I find most of the time with, with regard to this discussion with people that we have. People recognise their passions and desires, they get to point number two and that's where most of the time most people come to grief. So they feel their passions and desires. Most people can actually list them, quite a long list of all the things they like to do. You know, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that, I'd like to do this. And then every one of those li- things in the list triggers something emotionally. So how many of you have thought in your, in your life that you'd love to play a musical instrument? How many of you have thought you'd love to play a musical instrument? Almost everyone. How many of you actually play a musical instrument? All right. Less than a third of those people that put their hand up. Why, why is there a discrepancy between those two things? Fear is the discrepancy between those two things. See, we're not humble enough to just feel our emotions. What happens when we first face a musical instrument? What's the first emotion that you generally feel? Embarrassment. Embarrassment. I'm hey. not good at this. Oh, I'm not good at this. You, know, you, you, know, you pick up the guitar... And you don't know which way to hold it, firstly, right? <laughs> and then they tell you to hold it a certain way. And you start playing and it's like, I can't even hold down one string to pluck one note properly, right? And it goes, zzz, 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 instead of, you know, a nice sound, you know? And then, and, and then we go, oh, I'm not getting an immediate result, so what do I generally do? I give it up in frustration, <laughs> right? Or, or I put it away and go, oh, maybe it's not for me, you know? when you had the desire there present. You see, you know, after a while you start practicing and you do get the one note, you know, like you get one note. And then you learn about these things called chords. And you've got to hold a whole finger down somehow to create a bar chord, right? And, and so you go through all these emotions about that as well, which of course we do. And after a while, we get to 10 or 12 weeks into the process and all of a sudden something just starts to click. Something just starts to click where our desire starts to overcome. Our desire now has overcome a lot of our fears. And when our desires have overcome a lot of our fears now, things start to click into place. And when things start to click into place, now I can play a song, right? Because I've now overcome a lot of the fears. So in other words, because of my desire to play a music instrument, I've been humble to feeling all the feelings of confusion, all the fears that I have, that I'm stupid and I don't understand. And I'm reading the music going, what 
in the hell is that music? You know, what's that note? What's that? What, what, are, what are all these little symbols? You know, I don't even know all of them. And after all, I did start discovering a lot of them as well. But can you see how my desire draws me? If my desire is strong enough, it's going to draw me through all of those fears, isn't it? And eventually, I will get to play that instrument. Yeah? So, in other words, my desire has drawn me into this process where I'm willing to be humble and go through a process. Right? And eventually, I discover everything starts flowing. And then when everything starts flowing, that's when it becomes enjoyable. That's the first time it becomes enjoyable, actually, isn't it? Well, you think about that in your life. It's exactly the same. You identify your passions. It's only when you're humble enough to overcome most of your fears that your life following this passion will become more enjoyable. That's the only time it's going to become more enjoyable, when it starts to flow. Before then, you're just going to be feeling emotion after emotion, different confusions and all sorts of other feelings. Exactly the same. And, and can I say something contentious? that many people have never in their life connected to their true passions and desires. They've connected to something that they don't have a lot of emotional injuries around and they're quite good at, so they do that. When actually their passion might be music, but because they had a dad who disapproved and a mother who was competitive or whatever it is, they, never, they have so many emotions triggered when they even think about that desire that they don't even register at a, it yeah. as a desire. Yeah. So that's why this humility wanting to know God's truth is so crucial to this process. Yeah. Yeah. Don't and put up with telling yourself the error all the time. Do you know what I mean by that? We often do this. We tell ourselves that our fear is real a lot of the time. So, for example, if I'm picking up the musical instrument, like picking up the musical instrument, starting to play it, I can't get the note, and what is one of the first emotions that I'm probably going to feel? I'm stupid. Isn't it? Isn't that an emotion that we often feel when we start a new thing? I'm stupid. Where does that come from? Well, it obviously came from our childhood somewhere, didn't it? Someone must have told us we're stupid at some point. And, and so what I need to do is feel that emotion that I'm stupid. I need to process through and feel the emotion, release it from me, so I realise, no, I'm not stupid, I just need to be patient with myself here. I need to love myself enough to realise that I'm just picking up this instrument for the first time. Yeah, and that God's That's truth. God's truth. Now I can be in that place because I've released the untruth of my own judgement of myself. Yeah? Mm. And the last point is a really important point. Well, that is the God-reliance part. Mm. Many people will see God-reliance as, oh, it's just faith that God's going to look after me. When actually God, I feel God's like the ultimate parent, such a good parent in that God require, or requests desires from us that we develop, that we, it's not a passive process, that we must step into knowing ourselves in order to, be, to know God and to be cared for by God. So... God reliance is actually it requires three things from us: following our passions and desires in harmony with love, or as much as we know them to be, being humble in that process, and recognizing that if I'm if I'm in pain here, if something's not going, you know, if I feel afraid or grief stricken or pain in any way, there must be an error within me that needs to come up to b to be healed. And in that process, I have to want to know God's truth about every situation. Otherwise, I'll get stuck in just feeling the error. Now, through that process, my passions and desires will become more refined because I'll find parts of my passions and desires and go, oh, that was a bit addictive. And now I don't want that addiction anymore. I want to just live passionately in a loving way. So not only do my passions and desires become more loving, and what is one of the most powerful forces in the universe? A loving desire. Mm. So we become more powerful. And also through this process, this is when we can have faith and even knowledge that God is going to care for me. As long as I keep doing these three things, I, God is totally there supporting me and just keeping on bringing me the law of attraction events that I need in order to refine my soul, in order to become more powerfully loving. Mm. Mm. So God's like a loving parent who constantly wants to assist you to meet your passions and desires. But God only wants to assist you like in the, with, the, with the ones that are loving. When I say God, God will assist you all the time, 
but God will assist you to identify the ones that are unloving and remove them from you, if that makes sense. So, so even if you follow this and you find that one of your passions and desires is unloving, well, God will help you identify that through this process. Trust that whenever you are going stagnant, whenever you are stopping, whenever you sort of don't know what to do and you're in confusion, in that moment you are not in the place of trusting that actually God's right now telling you something. That something that you're trying to skip over, something you're trying to run away from. So in the case of uh, you know, being humble to the law of attraction, quite often the law of attraction is telling me exactly the thing that I'm trying to skip over. It's telling me. And yet I, I try to forget about it. I try to run away from that. The key is to allow yourself to embrace that. And th like I said to you, Fee, this is the area where most people come to grief with their passions and desires. They don't want to be humble to the things that go wrong. It's like picking up the musical instrument, not being able to play the note and putting the musical instrument down straight away because we don't want to feel how terrible we feel not being able to do just a basic thing. We just don't want to feel the feeling. Uh, where is the mic? Thank you. Um, what was your name? You've mentioned a lot of times the term God. Yep. I would like to ask what God is. Um, certainly. We I'm can talk gonna... about God. Firstly, God is an entity. So in other words, God is not just an energy or just a force, but rather God is an entity in the sense that, in the sense that God is, has a... Um, the entity of God has certain characteristics and attributes. So if we just write down some of these yeah, things. So God's an entity. God is the oversoul of the universe. And what I mean by that is, is that all things in the universe, spiritual and material in nature, have come from God in some way. So God is the great oversoul of the universe. I'll just let Mary Sorry. catch up. All things come from God. Now God has attributes and qualities. God also has personality. So God has attributes, qualities and personality. So God isn't just like some electrical plug, you know, where we're plugging it into electrical power. Electrical power doesn't have any personality really. It has some attributes, but it doesn't have a personality that you can interact with. So in other words, when you plug in your toaster or your oven into the electrical power, you don't all of a sudden start talking to the electrical power and say, I love you so much, you're a lovely person, and you know, it's lovely you're providing me. Because you know that the electrical power is just an energy flowing. Well, I'm saying to you that God has energy, but God is not just energy. Does that make sense? So God is not just the sum total of her attributes and qualities. God is actually an entity that we can connect to and have an individual relationship with, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with, just like you can have a relationship with your mother, exactly the same as that. Now, God also, parts of God's attributes and qualities is some of them are masculine in nature and some of the qualities are feminine in nature. And the, re the reason for that is that uh, there are qualities... Um, that we can feel from God, that we can feel are creative. And there are other qualities that are more like design-based qualities, if you like. And the key is to know these attributes and qualities. We can actually connect to the entity of God and start feeling the attributes and qualities of God. And therefore, we know that God is an entity. It's a bit like um, you have energy, do you not? But could, what was your name? Arya. Arya? Arya. 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 Um, so Arya has energy, does she not? Yes. But is energy Arya? Is that the only thing you are? 
your energy. No. You're more than that, aren't you? Yes. Because you also have personality, don't you? Your personality yes. is unique when you compare yourself to other people. So yeah. you have personality. And, but, did, but, if, but if I said Aria is personality, is that mm. the only thing you are? No. It's not, is it? Yeah. So can you see it's the same kind of thing that God is teaching us about God. And that is that God is an entity. God has attributes and, and qualities. God has personality. But one of these things is not God. So for example, I, could, I can say God is love. But love is not the only thing God is. Does that make sense? A bit. So in other words, God has other qualities besides love. What are some of the other qualities? Well, one, one other quality is wisdom. Yeah. God has wisdom. You look at everything that God has created, for example, in the universe, everything works together. You look at the things that are in nature, they all work together. The things that man creates, we often all have them working all opposite to each other. But the thing God creates all work together. So God has wisdom. God has power. In other words, like the sun itself, a creation of God, has immense amounts of power. So it tells me that God must be even more powerful than the sun. Um, God has justice. Because you can see justice in, in the universe. We don't see it much here on earth. But when you live in the spirit world, you see it all the time. You see justice all the time going on. You... God also has understanding and compassion, actually, for humans. Because there are times when you're going through an emotion and you long for God's understanding and you'll receive it. You will actually feel it as compassion. You'll feel an emotion from God. So in other words, God has emotions. God has feelings. And uh, they are all part of the attributes and qualities of God. And you can feel those feelings from God if you decide to connect to God as an entity. But one of the primary things about God is that you can only connect to God when you believe things that are truthful about God. All right? So in other words, if I believe God is just an energy, then the only thing I'm going to connect to is the energy of God. I'm not going to connect to God herself. I'm only going to connect to the energy that God gives. If I believe that God is only energy, I can only connect to the energy if I believe that God is God far more than that and has all of these other attributes and qualities, then I can start actually connecting to these attributes and qualities that God has. So what we encourage people to do is to stop seeing God as just one thing, like a force or, a, or an energy, and start seeing God as an entity with all these, person these attributes and qualities and personality that we can personally and individually connect to and then feel things from and feel things for. Just like you can connect to another person, like I can connect to Mary and I can feel feelings from her and I can feel feelings for her. And we can then enter a relationship because we now start to understand each other's feelings and emotions and feel them. And we can embrace this relationship on lots of different levels. It could be just a friendship. It could be like a mother-daughter relationship or a father-son rela father-daughter relationship or a, or a mother-son relationship. Or we can embrace this relationship on a different level. We can have an equal relationship. We can have a sexual relationship and so forth. So we have all these potentials of different type of relationship between two humans. And what I'm suggesting to you is we also have the potential to have a relationship with God, an individual relationship with God. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's how myself and Mary see God, as a bit of a summary about how we see God. Okay, thank yep. you. No worries. If we can go straight across. Okay. Hiya. Um, it's about passions and desires. I've got something that um, just gets in the way with everything, mm -hmm. really. Um, I've got a chronic sensitivity to fluorescent lighting. So whatever I want to do really, be it just go to the shops, take my little boy to a play group. I had to give up my job, which I really loved because it was just making me so ill. Mm -hmm. Even coming here on the plane, I felt absolutely wasted today yeah. going through the airport. And I'm, I'm just completely stuck because I have a desire, like I want to do dance classes, but I know they'll be lit with the fluorescence. Yep. 
I saw it, I, I didn't even know where to go because I just get this wall straight away where, I mean, I have to go under them. Could to, we say then that you have an allergy to electric lighting? It's not, I'm, I haven't got any problem with lights. But it's fluorescent, fluorescent, sorry, fluorescent, only fluorescent lights. Yeah. Yeah. So you ha let's call it an allergy, shall we, to fluorescent okay. lights. Let's call it that. Um, it's not, I don't think there's such a thing, but we'll call it that. Um, the reason why I want to call it that is because every single sensitivity we have that results in something happening to us physically is always connected to an emotion in our childhood of some kind. Do you follow me? Okay. Now, for example, if you're allergic to a cat, then there'll be some relationship, there'll be something that happened in your childhood that has caused you to be allergic to the cat. Some emotion connected with one or both parents, actually. Do you follow me? Okay. So, if we look at the establishment of all sensitivities, here's you, and then there's your two parents. Right. Every single piece of sensitivity you have, physically and emotionally, is going to be created by some event that occurred that was imposed upon you through your relationship with your parents most of the time. Now, when I say your parents most of the time, there could also be people who are in an authority position that have imposed some of these relationships too. So, for example, you went to school... And you probably started going to school when you were four or five. So therefore, they would also then have an effect on some of these relationships. But primarily, it's your parents. And then it's usually your, you know, so secondary in nature would be your teachers and so forth. Siblings. Right. Siblings can also have an effect on this process. But of course, your siblings are guided by your parents. So it usually always gets back to them at some point. Now... Everything that you become sensitive to in your adult life is going to be because of a, de a, a denied emotion from the childhood relationship, and particularly the childhood relationships with the two parents. Now, to give you an example with regard to the sensitivity to fluorescent lighting, let's say that there were fluorescent lights at your school when you went to school. Right? So you might not have had them at home, but you had them at school. And every time you went to school, or particularly the first times you went to school, your mother or your father or both of them became very distressed about you going to school. So in other words, at the same time as you going to school, there were these emotions being imposed upon you from your parents of their own distress and their own fear about you going off to school. And the difference between school and home was only one thing, the lights, the type of lighting between the two places. One of them were just normal bulb lights, let's say, that are just uh, heat-based heat light, and the other one is fluorescent lighting. Now, from that one event, you can automatically deny the fear associated from your parents and then associate it to the thing that's different in your environment. In other words, to the lighting, there's the only difference in your environment. Do you follow me? Okay. Yeah, I mean, there is there's an issue. I have psoriasis, or it, it's pretty good now, but um, I used to have to go under the lighting a lot at hospitals and stuff. Okay. And I had it at home. Okay. I used to use it intensively. Okay. So if lights were used to go under lights for the sake of some kind of illness that you have... Yeah. Then, then your sensitivity to light is going to be related to your unhealed emotions about those particular illnesses. Okay, like looking desirable and stuff. Just Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so you, the reality is that you will, once you heal that emotion, you will no longer be sensitive to fluorescent light. Okay. Does that make sense? That would be amazing. <laughs> 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 Well, the reality is it must be a very powerful emotion. Otherwise, you wouldn't be so sensitive. Can you see? It's yeah. got to be a fairly powerful emotion. And for you to even have not even acknowledged inside of your own head the relationship between the lights, the illness, and how you feel now. Do you follow me? What happened? Why did you have to go in the lights? Was it, was it because of... Oh, psoriasis. Psoriasis, yeah. skin, skin problems. Yeah. yeah. 
So can you see it's related to view of yourself, you know, and quite a lot of stuff. Skin problems are uh, in children are generally related to the rage and anger of their parents as well. So in other words, there's got to be a relationship between mum and dad's rage and anger, your skin problem, and then your focus on the light as the cure to the skin problem. Okay. Do you follow me? Yeah. You want to say more about that? No. I think that's... I think that's do, do you understand the relationships? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's to do with the... Well, wanting to feel desired or not looking, I don't know. Undesirable. It's, it's about not looking. It's not looking desirable. So you must have had a lot of projections from your parents about how you looked while you had the psoriasis. Right. Okay. Right. That you don't want to feel. And so then, every time you have fluorescent lighting, these feelings are churned up inside of you, and you don't want to feel them. And so now you feel sensitive to the light instead, to the fluorescent light instead. Okay. You? Follow me? Yeah. Can you see how yeah, most things no, are pretty simple, actually, yeah. emotionally? It just stops everything, really. Sorry? Well, it stops everything apart from being outside. <laughs> I even had to bring my own light bulbs because I knew the apartment would have those blooming energy bulbs. Yeah. But so can you see how, what length you'll go to to avoid yeah. the emotion? Well, can I mean, I go, yeah, mm, I don't know, because I do have to go under them. Well, I, I don't bring like my yesterday. light bulbs to my apartment. No, I know, but I have to. So it's like, if I didn't, I just wouldn't even be able to be here this morning. Well, I understand, but, but this is showing you the, the, uh, the, the resistance you have is so strong that you're willing to take your own light bulbs to a place rather than feel the emotion that the light causes you to feel. Do you feel? Do you see what I'm saying? You sort yeah. of feel quite angry about this whole situation, don't you? I was, yeah. Well, and I, was I would start there. You know, I think you need to process your rage. That that's the level of resistance to acknowledging that this problem begins with my soul condition. You know, you you want to be angry that it's not fair that I can't do it. So let yourself feel that. Yeah. Can I make a general comment about physical illnesses? Physical illnesses only begin after lots of denial. Now, okay. I'm not saying that you're to blame for your mm -hmm. denial because usually our denial was created as well by our parents. In other words, our parents projected huge emotions at us and then we, they also projected at us how to suppress that emotion because they didn't ever want us to be upset or angry or crying. So they also taught us how to suppress the emotion. So we're, we're, we are not to generally to blame for our denial but... But all illnesses come from a huge process of a long-term denial, generally. Now, the only illnesses that are actually not into that category are illnesses that occur in a child and are due to the parent's denial, their long-term denial of emotion, right? So the reality is that every single illness that we can ever have is all related to denial of emotion within us, a emotion, usually, and if, it, if it's one particular thing, then it will be one particular emotion. If we have a number of different illnesses, then there'll be a number of different emotions that are involved. And this is why it can be quite simple to cure problems, because all we need to do is connect with the emotion. However, the fact that we have a physical illness or a physical thing associated with, the emo with an emotion that we're not feeling means that we already have quite a strong denial of that emotion. Do you follow okay. me? Yeah, it's just the following the desire bit so hard because I really enjoyed my job, but I know I can't go back there. Yeah, but it's interesting you're still in this discussion focusing <laughs> on how I can't follow my desire rather than focusing on how you can feel the emotion that's preventing you. So I need to not follow the desire but go for the emotion instead of going... Well, no, no I'm, I I'm not saying don't follow your desire because we always feel you should follow them. Yeah. What I'm saying is you have a huge resistance to feeling the emotion associated with the fluorescent lighting. Okay. And that emotion is very much about what happened as a child with the skin problems and the projections of your two parents about you having those skin problems. Do you follow me? And that's the emotion you don't want to feel. You would rather carry a bag of light globes yeah. around with you than feel that emotion. Okay. Yeah? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I do. I'm just stuck. 
<laughs> can, you, can you see Mary gave you the answer to you being stuck? Of the anger thing. Start with your anger because you're actually quite angry about it. And when you feel your anger about it, then you'll feel some of your fear about it. And the fear is very much associated to, to one of your parents in particular, not you feeling that she does not love you. Okay. Right? And, and very concerned about physical appearance. Is that not the case? Right. Oh, what, me? Concerned? No. Oh, mum? Yeah. Oh, probably. Yeah. And that's okay if mum hears that. She'll be right. <laughs> Please. Um, you, you said a moment ago that all illnesses are caused by our emotions. How can that be when if someone's exposed to radiation or exposed to an AIDS virus and they get ill? I mean, that's not an emotion-based illness, is it? Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. There'll be a time when we, the human race clears all emotions that even exposure to radiation will not harm us. It's pretty radical, huh? Yeah, I <laughs> can't say that I'm convinced. But <laughs> yeah. Can I point out that uh, fear is the dominant emotion in the human race? Mm -hmm. Everyone understands that. Fear is the dominant emotion. But it's the suppression of our fears that is dominant. Right? We try to f suppress them constantly. Almost our entire life is spent suppressing our fears. We spend more time suppressing our fears than we do doing anything else. Fear causes almost all human, or it does cause all, all human pain. All human pain is caused by the emotion of fear. So any fear that is inside of you is what creates pain. Now, you can test this out if you like, even in your own life. You get a person to massage you and press at a place that you feel a lot of pain on your body. You know, like, like if, if it's the shoulder, just get someone to grab your shoulder and just press there and feel the pain. Now, you will find that whatever that fear is, loca is, is connected to that pain, when you release the fear, the person can squeeze your shoulders as much as they want and you will not feel any pain. In fact, you will actually feel pleasure no matter how hard they squeeze. Right? Yeah, but I mean, if you just take an, an example of a world event like Chernobyl, right? Yes, yes. Um, those people there, okay, Naturally, everybody would be frightened if they lived in an area like that. No, but I'm saying no. I'm saying it's not about living in the area like that. Fear is a part of human, the human race. It's in the soul of every single person on this planet before they're even one year old. They've already got fear, huge amounts of fear. And it's the fear that actually causes our response to every other thing. Why do some people, for example, respond to a disease, get a disease, and other people don't? The disease is still real. Why, doesn't, why does one set of people not get the disease and the other? We call it immunity, yes? That's what we say, they've got immunity. What I'm suggesting to you is that it's all to do with fear. A whole lot of it's to do with fear. You release all of your fears, you will never need to be inoculated for anything again. And all of those diseases will still exist but they will not enter your body again. They, and I'm, I'm saying to you, the same applies to radiation as well. Like everything God... Cre do, do you think God created a harmful universe for us to live in? Like most people do believe God created a harmful universe. I believe God never created a harmful universe. It has only become harmful to us because of our fear. That's what I'm suggesting to you. It's a radical thought, I know. Hmm. And when you have, when you have also, it's not, yeah, it's not a, it's not also like a, um, a simple concept where it is a simple truth, but there is a lot in the concept. Like, um, for an illness such as HIV/AIDS, there's a huge law of attraction at work for everyone on the planet and their emotional condition surrounding that illness and causing the effects of that illness. So it's not to say, oh, you've got the disease, so it's your fault. No, I'm living on this planet as well, and I project emotions and have fear as well. And I, part of the law of attraction involves my soul condition. So in other words, if a person, for example, is, is judgmental of a gay person, 
That's a part of creating this disease, the judgment that comes from an individual. And all of our judgments come from fear. All of them. Every time we judge somebody, we're already in a place of fear. It's also not discounting the actual disease process. Like the disease process exists, it's real. but we're just saying its origin comes from an emotional state. Yeah. Every so single disease is real. There's no such thing as, I don't believe in the sort of, there's a religious, uh, there's quite a number of different religious religions that will teach you that no disease is real. My feeling is disease is totally real. I agree. The cellular thing Distru that happens in your body is a real process. They're all real processes. However, once we release our fear, none of those processes will ever affect us again. Once we release our fear. Now, on the pro when what we've been describing to people is once you become at one with God, all of your fears are removed. Once, once all of your fears are removed out of your soul you will never, ever get sick from anything. There won't be such a thing as radiation poisoning for you. There won't be such a thing as getting a disease like malaria or catching some other form of uh, illness. There won't be any viruses that affect you because once you're in that place, you've no longer got any fear for any of these things to interact with. That's the result of fear on the planet. Fear, fear is such a huge problem on this planet it causes everything we have that's negative it causes all of our pain all of our pain and see when we're unwilling to feel our fears we're only going to cause more pain both to ourselves and to other people that's the reality now in the future we hope myself and Mary hope to demonstrate all of that to you physically right but but obviously we're not yet ourselves in the condition where we can do that but through this process that we're going through, that we're illustrating to others that they can go through, you can... And this was the pl place where I was in the first century. I was without fear. And when you're without fear, nothing can affect you. There's no illness that you can catch. There's no thing that, you, you know, no, there's no physical thing that can affect you on the planet. The only thing that can affect you is somebody coming along and severing you from your body. That's the only thing that can affect you. And in fact, your body can live thousands of years like that. Because it completely replicates itself consistently. There was a lady uh, sorry. who's had a hand up for a while. Yeah. So, yeah. And then we'll come down to that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I would like to know how do you actually um, recognise... And how do you connect that fear with this, uh, or that emotion with a specific event? What is it that is stopping me from recognizing that? Is it my resistance? Because I have a hard time... It's I the opposite to what you're thinking, though. Excuse you don't me. have to connect the emotion to an event because the event will come up as you feel the emotion. As you connect to the emotion. <laughs> most I mean of a, us an event from... Um, the past. My, yes. Yeah, yeah. See, see, what most people think is they... They, most people think they can think themselves through the process. Now, in doing the thinking, what we finish up doing is go, all right, I've got this emotion. Now, what event in my past is linked to this emotion? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But what I'm suggesting to you is to scrub thinking. It doesn't work very well with accessing any emotion. It's actually a product of our fear. <laughs> it's actually a product a of our fear. A desire to control where we're going to go when we get, to this, when we get into this So emotion. is it really a resistance that is stopping me from feeling? Yes, yes, it is. It's always resistance that stops you from feeling because a child, if you look at a child, they never stop feeling. They're always feeling. And it's only when we resist their process of feeling they stop feeling. Right? A child by nature just automatically feels everything. You know, when they're angry, they yell. And when they're, when they're sad, they cry. They, they don't go, oh, am I allowed to cry? This is now the supermarket. Mummy won't like it, me crying <laughs> there. So no, I won't cry here. I'll cry when I get home. <laughs> you don't see any child doing that, right? The child doesn't think through the process. It just has an emotion. The emotion is, uh, you know, whatever the emotion is, sadness in this case that I'm illustrating, and it cries. And if it's in the supermarket, too bad. It's crying anyway. That's how the child is, right? Now, how does the child process emotion? It, it just feels the emotion, doesn't it? Nothing else. It doesn't actually do anything else other than feel the emotion. 
It, it doesn't try to work out where it came from, does it? The child's not sitting there going, yeah, I'm feeling a bit sad at the moment. Now, you know, where did this sadness come from? Was it from my dad or was it from my mum? Or was it from two weeks ago when mummy smacked me or that I still got left over? Or what is it from? The child doesn't do that. What does the child do? It feels sad. It cries. It doesn't have any delay even but usually between the sadness and the crying. And the only time it has have delay is when the parents have imposed something upon the child. Ask. Um, okay, so when you, the example you gave earlier, if somebody squeezes me here and I feel the pain, yeah. that there's fear there, there's an emotion there. There's an emotion there. And you say when you get rid of the fear, the pain will go away and I won't feel anything. That's correct. Uh, what kind of fear do I remove? You don't need to worry about the fear. Your, you, your you body will tell you. You get, them to press the, you get them to press your shoulder until it's painful and then you breathe into the pain. You just let yourself feel the pain. That's all you need to do. Just let yourself feel this pain. And as you feel the pain, you'll start to find an emotion coming up if you have no resistance. In other words, if you're not using your mind to try to find out what it is, you will actually automatically have the emotion come up. And if you just let the emotion come up without judging it, without saying, oh, what's this about, or without going, oh, this is a bit weird, I'm just crying and I don't even know why. See, how many times do we even say those words? I'm crying and I don't even know why. We go, as if that's a problem, <laughs> don't we? Usually we, go, we, we should know why we're crying. You know, Usually we prefix it with, I'm sorry, I'm crying, I don't know why. Can you imagine the child going, I'm crying and I've got no idea why. This is a problem. <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't do that, does it? It just cries until the tears are ended, till they're done, right? So, so you see, what we're trying to do when we're thinking is we're trying to link together childhood events with different things. And, diff and in reality, what we're trying to do is prevent the emotion. We need to learn to embrace the emotion. If we can't embrace the emotion, embrace the pain first. So start with the pain and let the pain lead you to the emotion whatever the pain is. So if it's an emotional pain, sometimes you feel it in your heart, you know, you feel hurt. That embrace the pain of it and eventually the emotion will surface. Does that make sense? It, it, there needs to be a willingness to be overwhelmed and a lot of us think and because we, we want to control that feeling of being overwhelmed. What's this going to be about? Okay, I can feel that a little bit. If we just allow this whole experience to overwhelm us, we'll be overwhelmed by the pain and then without thinking anything, the emotion does come up. But it, a lot of us have a lot of... Sorry. No, it's all right. <laughs> it was, feels good. It was like, I was really giving the example. <laughs> she's, she's grabbing me. Like. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of us have a lot of fear about being overwhelmed. It feels out of control. And for most people, when we commence even thinking about um, feeling our emotions or being humble, as we call it, um, th one of the first blocks is, this is going to be out of control, I'm going to feel overwhelmed. And that's, that's the fear. And that's when we kick with. in the thinking. Yeah. We, st we kick in the thinking then. We'll analyse it we'll start, so that we don't have to. Yeah. You don't need to analyse, you just need to feel the emotion that's present. That's all you need to do. When you, the irony is when you feel the emotion that's present, what happens afterwards is it tells you the event. Afterwards. So usually what happens, and, and some of the events, by the way, are so young in our life that we don't have any cognizant memory of the event. So in other words, they happened when we were one years of age and we don't know what it was all about. And so w the emotion may not tell us any event because we can't even remember the details of the event because we didn't have a developed brain to do so. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't worry about that at all? Don't worry about knowing the event. You just need to feel the emotion. And if the emotion occurred at a stage in your life when you, know, you were, had enough of a development in your intellect to know, then what will happen generally is it will tell you that event. It will give you an indication of when that happened in your life. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah. So Thank it's sort you. of the opposite way to what most people try to do it. Most people try to think about it, link it all up, talk about it, discuss it with everybody. But we do all of that because we want to not feel it. When we just feel it, we focus on feeling it, and 
if you can't feel the emotion, remember I said feel the pain that's on the emotion. So feel the pain if you can't feel the emotion. Feel the pain and that will usually lead you to the emotion. And once you get to the emotion, once you've released the emotion, then you may know more about the event. But you're never going to know more about the event without that process. Thank you. All right. And we were coming down to here. It's all answered now, is it? Or? Yeah. Yep. We want to come across to... Who, who, who's... The previous... Uh, the, this Subject? This thing you just told, yeah. it's pretty much like made it clear. But uh, for me, when I try to... Because I have lots of aggression. And when I try to process... Every time I just want to go to sleep and I just fall on the floor, I can't move. My muscles just, I mean, I'm just become really like, I have no energy at all. So I can't process anger. So you, right. go, you feel the anger coming up yeah. and then you just feel yeah, lethargic. Like you feel weak. Fall, fell yeah. on the bed and just, I can't do anything. Yep. Yeah. And sometimes I go straight into fear, but is this... I think it's not normal. I, I think I have to process anger first and then go into fear. Can, yeah, there's, it's very true. If you've got anger, you're going to need to feel it. And then underneath that anger, uh, there will be generally some beliefs systems that are in error. And then underneath those beliefs will be the fears that those beliefs are trying to cover, right? And then underneath the fears will be the sadness or the grief. Now... If you find yourself not getting to anger, it will be because of some par parental beliefs about rage. It's actually about fear of anger. So it's fear of anger. And this is a challenge when we start to go, okay, I'm going to feel my emotions. We're confronted with all the fact that pretty much globally we're emotionally crippled. We're told from a very long, young age, don't feel that, feel this. This is a good thing to feel, you shouldn't feel that. Here's a reward because you felt that, oh, you, you're feeling that, I don't love you anymore. Like a lot of emotion, like we get a lot of messages about emotions. If you have this emotion, you're attention seeking. If you have that emotion, you, you know, all kinds of things that then generate a huge amount of fear about just being emotional. Can I ask you, what in your childhood happened whenever you got angry? What did mum and dad do with your anger? I don't remember. You don't remember. See, that's very interesting. Everything we don't remember is interesting because it usually means we've got a lot of denial about it, right? You're not allowed to be angry? Were you just told it? If we use the microphone, though, because otherwise... We just maybe have both mics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um. I remember being told by my dad that as, for as long as I was a child, I was not allowed to be angry. You have to be over 18 to become angry. Wow. So when like you be I become older to be angry. Yeah. So when you became angry, what did he do? What did mum and dad do? This is the this is the important. I think they just stopped listening. They just stopped paying me attention. Right. So so you learned that if you got angry, nobody would listen to you anymore. That's true. Mm. Can you see there's a uh, uh, so the, the, can they see that that's the fear about anger as soon as I get angry now nobody's going to listen to me Lots of it, and so some of us feel angry. it's a vehicle for us to be humiliated some of us got laughed at when we were angry so some of us like got belted when we were angry yeah. So so when we if we got belted when we were angry then that's telling us that if I get angry I'm going to get clobbered I'm going to get violence Have a mic. Does that answer your question? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If we come over here and then if we can have the mic down here too. What was your name? Uh, Je um, Jessica. Start, starts with Jessica. A Jessica. That's yeah. right. Yep. yep. No worries. Good question. Yeah. Myself and Mary were expecting this question from you. 
So we had a chat. We had our chat with our spirit friends last yesterday about your situation, and we talked to them about the emotions that were involved. Can, yep. Can yeah. we repeat the question? Yep. So just. Oh, you didn't get Karen, it. Karen. Karen has it. Karen has it. Is it coming out of the speakers? Doesn't sound like it is. Ah, so it's just, it's Karen, isn't it, asking, yeah, that she has a desire to show that everything can be healed. Um, she's been going through lots of emotions and she wants to know what she's missing. She feels like she's still in denial after all this time. Now, put, put, put it... Correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the problem you have is the eating away of your muscles. Is that correct? What, what is the actual physical... If you use the microphone. Yeah. It's not working. He, he just turns it up when it gets past oh, yeah, you. Yep. She has the, the neuromuscular disease yes. yep. that uh, the Ails. signal doesn't go through. This is the they call the allotrophic lateral sclerosis as ALS or yep. Lou Gehrig disease or I don't know what other name they call it. It's similar to multiple sclerosis in it. Uh, yes, it's the same kind yep. because the connection of the signal to the muscle. Yeah, uh, through the nervous system, the connection from the nervous system to the muscle. Yeah. Okay. It's broken down it's broken and down. causes the muscles then to, to waste. Yep. The muscles doesn't get any movement, so they just disappear. They slowly waste away yeah. as a yep. result. Yep. Yep. But that's the effect rather than the cause. Yeah, exactly. Yep, gotcha. Okay. All right. Do you want to start with this one? I'm a, I'm a little nervous um, about uh, channeling the wrong information. So um, when we spoke to our guides... Uh, they, they were relating that there's some anger in your life that you have skipped over. From your childhood. Yeah. And that you've had all your life very high expectations of yourself to be a strong woman and very independent. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Now, the beliefs that stop you from being able to process this, this anger is a belief that anger is not spiritual. How many of you also feel the same or you were taught that in your you know, past? You think of, from a Christian perspective, how much are we taught that if we, as soon as we're angry, that's it? We're not being spiritual anymore, that's it. So we, we're taught that anger is not spiritual and, and as a result of that we then have a belief that we cannot, we're not allowed to feel our anger, that it's wrong to feel it as a result. Now, when, when we don't allow ourselves to feel our anger, we do something with it instead. We internalise it. In other words, we aim the anger at ourselves rather than putting it outwards. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to everybody as to what happens with your anger when you don't choose to feel it? Now, we're not suggesting that a person who's angry needs to go out and blame everybody in the universe for their anger. What we're suggesting is you need to learn how to express your anger and feel the anger itself. When you internalise it, you now aim the anger at yourself. Now, whenever you aim anger at yourself, you will instantly begin to cause degradation in your system, in your body system. Do you follow me? So your body will instantly start to respond to the rage that you're aiming at it. All right? Now, what happens then is you're in a state of being in a rage now with yourself rather than just experiencing the rage. So if we can say, when you, when you have anger, there's two, two main things that people do, and both of them are in error. One is to get angry at the people around us, and the other one is to get angry at ourselves. Both things don't release the anger. It's living in the anger. 
to release the anger, we have to own it truly as there's an error within me, allow the experience of the, the emotional energy of the anger to leave us, and if we desire to know what's underneath it, it will become apparent. Yeah. So, so let's now see what happens with anger. With anger, when I get angry, and instead of feeling my anger myself, if I then projected it at Mary, what happens is a whole group of spirits who are also angry at women now express their anger through me as well towards Mary. Do you follow me? So now what's happening is I've got, I've got anger that I'm, denied, try, you know, I'm expressing towards Mary. I'm not internalising it, I'm externalising it, which is the other thing we do. And so I'm externalising it and I'm now leaving myself open to every other person spiritually who also wants to externalise their anger towards Mary. Do you follow me? Now when I internalise it and be angry with myself, I am at that moment opening myself spiritually to every spirit around me who wants to blame me. Do you follow me? So this is what's happening with you as well. There's, there's now these, these spirits who want to actually be angry with you as much as you want to be angry with you rather than just be angry with everything that happened in your childhood, right? And as a result of that, these spirits attach to your body and even make it worse. Like they actually draw energy from the body. Right? Do you have more... Just tell us if there's another part to the question coming now. Is yeah. That, yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, it's okay. Just let us know. Because we're, yeah. we're happy to answer the question in a bit more detail. You want, would like a bit more detail? Yeah. Yep. So, so, so does everyone understand? Because it's very important that everyone understands how we use anger. Right? It's all very important to understand what the dynamics are, what actually goes on. So we have a belief system that anger is not spiritual. If we have that belief system, what will happen, we'll do one of two things. We'll generally internal or externalise the anger. Most people who have this belief, anger is not spiritual, will internalise the anger. In other words, they'll keep it held within without expressing it. Or suppress it. Suppress its expression but it then becomes a big projection out, yeah, so. out of us so when we internalize this anger we are now inviting every other person around us in the spirit world to also blame us or in other words they will project the same level of rage that we're projecting at ourselves they will also project at us generally that's a part of the law of retraction we're allowing that to occur because of that we then have a physical problems depending on how we're developing or not expressing the anger. So, so for example, if the anger is with uh, our mother and the anger is about how our mother viewed us as a child and that anger is about how unworthy we feel when we're with our mother, then the anger will actually enter our body in this region of our body, here. Right? in the second chakra region on the left-hand side. And our internalised anger can get so bad that we can actually eventually cause a disease in that particular area of our body, which affects us. Now, if our anger is towards our father, and he was a very intellectual man, and he shut us down through his intellect all the time with regard to our anger, and he, then our anger may start to affect our brain and our nervous system that's different a location because of the different type of anger that we are not allowing ourselves to feel does that make sense so every single type of feeling we suppress is linked to um either either gender generally or both genders it could be both genders that it's linked to but as we suppress it and the type of anger it's linked to in our childhood in terms of the events and all of those kind of things will actually create the disease in a location of our body that mirrors those events in some way. So for example, for myself, I had a part of my bowel removed when I was two years of age on my left hand side, here's second chakra. My bowel still causes me trouble because I'm still not dealing with 
my feelings about of there's a huge amount of sadness I have about um, the loss of my heavenly mother. Does that make sense? And I have a feeling that my heavenly mother, God, my heavenly mother, has rejected me and abandoned me and will not look after me and doesn't want to know me and doesn't want to have anything to do with me. And I had that feeling as a process that resulted from the process of reincarnation that myself and Mary went through. Now, because of that, I had this huge injury that's still present in my body and I can feel it even now. I can feel the pain of it. I wake up with the pain of it every morning and I'm resistive to releasing that emotion. And as a result of that, this area of my body constantly hurts. And it will continue to constantly hurt until I'm willing to stop internalising the anger I feel right, and start to express the anger I feel about God abandoning me. And once I feel the anger about God abandoning me, then I'll get into the sadness about God abandoning me, which is like a great big heavy band across my chest and once I feel that this whole area of my body will start working again and it hasn't worked for a long time and it'll start working again does that make sense just by working through that emotion so so the key is to see every single physical ailment as something that is suppressed emotionally which is what you do see the key then is to go back to this childhood anger that you have and allow yourself to start feeling this anger that you have about how you've been treated when you were little and it's in particular with one parent so let yourself feel the anger you have with that particular parent yeah when you let yourself feel the anger you have with that particular parent now your body has the capacity to begin to heal itself but at the moment, the body is not going to have the capacity to heal itself. Yeah? So you're doing good. You're doing good connecting with that, that grief that's there and that bit of that anger that you can feel is present. Yeah? And the key is just to let yourself feel that emotionally. Now, in the future, once one person becomes at one with God, a person with your particular illness could be healed, but they would have to also be willing to deal with that anger. To be healed so either way it needs to be dealt with otherwise it will just cause itself again yeah does that make sense so um, can you see how we treat ourselves with anger generally we externalize or internalize now many of us I've noticed that many in Greece have this going on <laughs> yeah you see that quite a lot when you go out driving where there's a, da, 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 da. But, but it's interesting when they do that, it's not a real feeling. It's like a, the feeling you get from many who are expressing their anger. It's almost like a show. Do you, many of you in Greece would feel that, you know, where it sort of feels like they're, it's a big show really. It's not, they're not fully connecting to I it. I call it romanticising anger. It's romanticising the anger, <laughs> yeah. you know. Oh, no, 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 you know, and, and off they go. And... And that's not really feeling the anger either. The feeling of the anger is a real feeling that you will have inside of you that will not be romanticised or controlled in some way. Yeah. Katerina, would you like to? I'd like to ask something on her behalf. Yeah. <laughs> what can I do while I sit here to feel my anger? What can you do to, um, to feel your anger? Well, I feel what she's doing right now is exactly what she needs to do. Yeah, like, so, so for Karen, it's just a matter of just feeling that comes up. Myself and Mary just pointing out to, to Karen the feeling she has, which is this childhood anger that she feels, automatically starts to help you feel it. See, nobody has really acknowledged that feeling in you before. That's why you've not really felt it strongly because no one's really given her that acknowledgement that she was treated badly when she was little and she's allowed to feel the anger of that rather than to blame herself for it. So at the moment there's a lot of blaming of herself for even having the anger. Right? When, when we acknowledge the truth for a person, what happens is we, we allow them to process the emotion by acknowledging that truth. 
So, so for, for many of us in our childhood, what we, what we finish up doing is we grow up with our parents' perspective. So you imagine here's you, the child, and you've got these two great big ugly people. Oh, I won't say that. They're great big people, shall we say. But sometimes they look quite ugly to you, right, as a child, because you're looking up at them and you're seeing these monsters sometimes who seem to be totally in a rage projecting at you that you're all to blame for their problems. Right? So these two people are often saying to this child, you're all to blame for my problem. Just, just, and often yell it and scream it and actually say it during the process. Right? Now this child is now absorbing all of that and then having to feel like that's true. That's what the parents want them to believe. The parents want them to believe the child is the problem. Right? And so what the child finishes up doing, this child, is it starts thinking it's the problem. So when the parents treat the child badly or the parents are disappointed with the child or the parents uh, feel you know, emotions towards the child, the child's then taught that not only do I have to put up with this barrage of stuff coming from my parents, but I also have to believe that it's all my fault that they're giving it to me. Now as soon as somebody makes a statement, no, it was not your fault and you are allowed to feel this anger, straight away that starts to open us up emotionally. So, so one way to help Karen, if we're around Karen, is to be open to feeling anger, our own anger, and not judge anybody who needs to feel their anger. That's one way to help the other person straight away. Now, I don't have judgment for a person feeling their anger, and I have less judgment than most of the people in the audience, and so that's why discussing it with Karen automatically allows her to feel that she's, in th uh, she's able to feel some of her own emotions. Does that make sense? Could, could I talk about that a little bit? The mm. power of the, the truth told in a loving way to unlock our emotions. Be and many of you have experienced this with AJ, haven't you? Where he lovingly tells you a truth about something that you might have even intellectually thought, but because of the love that's present when he, he speaks that truth, it unlocks, it unlocks the emotion within you. I sort of and feel like it's not just the love either. It's also my openness to that emotion itself. Do you know yes. what I mean? Like, like God is totally open to you experiencing every emotion. When you have a relationship with God, you will be open to everyone around you experiencing every emotion they have. You won't feel judgment towards them feeling those emotions. So when a person goes into anger, you won't feel, you're angry now, you're a bad person. You're, you won't feel all that because that feeling doesn't exist in you. You, you feel open to that. Yeah, feel your anger. This is very good. You know, you, you, want, you, you have a feeling of wanting them to feel their anger, but you want to, to help them connect deeper as well to their fear and their sadness. You have an openness to fear. You have an openness to sadness and grief. You have an openness to shame. So this is why people can come up to you and then say, like, I, I feel really ashamed, and they tell you a, really what, a story they've never told anybody in their entire life, because they can feel your openness to feeling them feeling their shame. So and I, I guess I see that as a quality of it love. It is a quality so of love. So it is there, a so. quality of love to be open to everyone's experience and however they are. And this is why I, it, it was just leading on to a point that I wanted to make today anyway, that I feel it's very hard for us to process our emotions without the presence of God. It's very hard to heal our injuries within without having a desire for a relationship with God. I, I don't feel I could possibly do it, actually, because um, has, it, has anyone seen the movie The King's Speech? Yeah? Yeah? Some of you? So it's about a king of England, and he had a stammer, a stutter, really intense one, and it's very well acted. Uh, Colin, Colin Firth it is, isn't it? He acted it amazingly, and I could feel the trauma of this, this speech impediment that he had. And he it depicted his father as someone who was very critical with him about this stammer and he just needed to spit it out and come on and get on with it. And during this story, it, it relays um, a relationship that he develops with a speech therapist from Australia. And what happened in the relationship with this guy was that he began to heal his stammer. Now, he, what, it, what it showed to me very beautifully was what happens when we have... The, the presence of love and friendship in our life to actually open us to healing the injuries within us. 
So, and it, for me, it was about God, you know. It's very hard for me to heal my injuries, even if someone's telling me the truth about what they are, if there's not the presence of love and a, the sense of safety that love gives me in that process. So when I enter this process of emotionally processing with God, I'm open to receiving the love and the security that comes from and the openness that God has to the truth of what happened in my childhood, the openness to my pain that God has. So that loving presence helps me heal. And in the movie, it was through the love, it was not just through the addressing of his injury or his error that helped him heal. It was the fact that he formed a significant loving relationship with another person that helped him heal. Mm. And for me, it, that was just a huge allegory about what, what this path is, can, is really about. Mm. And it, it is a, a bugbear of mine when I see people um, getting into the language of the path and starting to feel things from other people and saying, the truth is you've got this emotion. Now, many people see AJ saying, the truth is you've got this emotion. And they, for, they forget entirely that he's saying that from a space of love. And instead, it can be very easy to live in our injuries. So they accuse instead they of accuse. love. They accuse. They want to prevent this person or make this person heal or have the sense of power of seeing this in the other person. Or even having an enjoyment that you can put, pick out an emotional injury in somebody else. You know? And so that's a feeling of condescension, power over them, all sorts of emotions that we have in that place. Yeah. And, and for me then, that feels so damaging to this path that we are teaching. Really, this path is about growing in love and making a connection with God. Now, in that process, I may grow in love myself and be able to offer truth in a loving way to my brother or my sister. However, when I try to skip to just saying the truth bit and not developing this love, very damaging, mm -hmm. very damaging. In fact, you're doing exactly what the parents did with the child when you think about it. Because, see, many parents picked on something the child really had wrong with them, right? So, you know, the child... You can't play guitar. The <laughs> child may have a skin blemish, right? The child may have a skin blemish. So the parent goes, oh, you're looking ugly. You look ugly all the time. You know, don't get out of my sight. You know, you look ugly, you know? Now, now sure, the skin blemish may look ugly. So it may be a truth in that regard that the parent's telling the child. But does it feel any good? Is there any love coming with it? Definitely not. There's no compassion. There's no understanding. You know, the child picks up a guitar, like Mary said, and tries to play a note. The parent says, shut that infernal racket up. You know, like, <laughs> right? So, so what, what, what's happening there? Like, yes, it is a racket. So that is the truth. But with the racket, with the statement comes what? All this emotion of anger and resentment and, you know, the parent is angry with the child. So, so when we go into any situation where we're accusing another person of having an emotion, where we're judging the emotion that they actually have, right? when we're actually angry with the emotion they have... And then we just say, I'm just telling you the truth. <laughs> or we're afraid of the emotion they have. Or we're ashamed of the emotion that they have. Can you see, every one of those is just an, another burden the person now has to bear before they can feel their own emotion. See, see if, a person, if I'm discussing something with a person, it's very rare for the person not to feel the emotion we're discussing. The reason why is because I don't feel those emotions towards them about what we're discussing. That's the only reason why. If, if we feel love and openness to the emotion and we don't have those feelings coming out of us towards the person and their emotion, there's a very high likelihood the person will be able to process some of that emotion right in front of us. But if we feel any of those things towards the person, it is highly unlikely the person is ever going to be able to get into an emotion about what we're discussing. Because all they're getting from us is exactly the same thing that their parents gave them which is not love, but rather those things. Right. So that's a very important thing to remember about helping a person with emotion. If you have any judgment, any accusing, any anger, any fear, any shame about the same emotion you're discussing with another person, it is highly unlikely you're going to be able to help the person in any way. It is not helpful for you under those circumstances to say, you have fear or you have anger, 
when the reality is that you've got out coming out of you all of this judgment and stuff towards their emotion. All they're going to feel is, yes, they do have that emotion and on top of that, they don't feel attracted to dealing with it because of your accusation. Does that make sense? So we've got to stop this process of pointing the fingers at people like rather rather we want to embrace this process of being open to their emotion open to loving them to in their loving emotion. them in no matter what state they're in yeah and this requires humility on our part we have to be willing to feel our own emotions before we can love so it's not a small task we we did a channeling the other day which was referring to the level of spirit influence that um or spirit attack if you like that's directed towards us at the moment Sorry, baby, you... It's all right. I'm just adding to the list. Yep. How do you spell laughter? Laughter. Pride. Yeah. Any... Uh, yep, keep going, darling. You're no. saying the right yep. thing. Yep. Um, uh, it was about the spirit attack that's aimed at us, and we were discussing it on Wednesday night, if you remember, and many of you felt it, hey, towards yourselves in your own lives, and many of you felt it today, I know, coming here as well. Um, and our guides said something very beautiful to us about it, and that was that... We have to stop feeling like we're at war. <laughs> we have to begin to love. And that does require a lot of humility on our part, but that is truly the only hope <laughs> of coming out from under spirit attack ourselves and the beautiful benefit of also loving in, that, in this situation that we're currently in is that it will assist the greatest number of spirits possible. So, so we're not at war with our attackers. Hmm. We need to learn to love our attackers no matter who they are. So if they are your parents attacking you or, you know, your spirits attacking you or the government attacking you or some kind of process that's been involved that attacks you, the key is to love all of these things rather than be at war with them. As soon as you're at war with them, you're in this place with them all and that doesn't help you or them deal with any emotion. This loving that we're talking about is not a namby-pamby sort of a concept. It requires a lot of humility. We have to be willing to, instead of defend the fear, feel the fear. We have to be willing to, instead of wanting to pre like prevent the attack, receive it and feel how horrible it feels to be annihilated, to be condescended to, to whatever it is. It's only through the, that release, that expression of that emotion, that we can truly love. And when you do that... I tell you, you will feel the power of that. Yeah. If, you, if you're saying, oh, no, I'm loving them, I'm loving them, and nothing is changing that interaction, you're not loving yet. Because like desire in harmony with love, loving intent projected at anyone is the most powerful thing they will ever experience when there's a purity in that love. And especially if you yourself have received God's love and then you love that is something that most people on this planet have never even tasted. Mm. Most people... Everyone who's attacking us right now has never tasted that feeling. Yeah. Mm. So whenever we feel those emotions in us towards another person having their emotion, the, the best thing to do is be completely quiet about talking to them about their emotion and to instead go away and feel our judgments and our fears and our anger and our laughter and shame and you know all the emotions we have about the the emotions they have we cannot help them no matter how much we know and no matter how much spirit direction there is and no matter how much spirit direction there is no matter how much we know we will never be able to help them uh, while we have these emotions coming out of us because while these emotions are coming out of us uh, accusatory, uh, accusatory judgmental angry fearful well, you know, shame, even laughing at them, condescending towards them, in a place of arrogance with them. Whenever we feel any of those things, that to be open to their emotion, they're just going to get reinfected with what their parents have already projected at them. And that doesn't help anybody. We're far better off going away from them than we are even opening our mouth, even though we might know exactly what the problem is. Because opening our mouth is going to do nothing while we have those emotions in us projected at them. Yeah. Probably a good Should time to have a break, break now, is yeah. it? Yeah. God gave me the gift of the guests next door mistreating their child this morning. Ah, yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. You know, when you mentioned to me in this discussion 
that you had earlier about um, about the next door the, your next door neighbour in the motel and how they treat their children. That's exactly how you were treated as a child. Mm -hmm. Exactly how you were treated. And this is the beauty of the law of attraction: is that it, it gives us this perfect ability to to you know reflect upon our own childhood. That's that's the beauty of it. Yeah, you're dead mm -hmm. right. How how they were treating their children, exactly how you were treated. Mm -hmm. And this is this is why you feel angry about it, and you need to let yourself feel angry about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Okay, let's have a break for half an hour or so, shall we make it? Get to know each other a bit. Have a good <laughs>